Sapolsky, analysis. On May 27th, 2005, DreamWorks dropped the first entry in its next flagship franchise, Madagascar. The movie starred Ben Stiller, David Schwimmer, Chris Rock, and Jada Plinkett Smith as four animal escapees of the Central Park Zoo, who wash ashore on the island of Madagascar. But the breakout stars were far and away the Penguins, a group of elite commandos on a high priority mission to reach Antarctica. Just smile and wave, boys. Smile and wave. Skipper was the charismatic and determined leader, Private the mild-mannered English rookie, Kowalski the intel officer, and Rico the silent weapons and supply specialist. Despite having under 10 minutes of screen time, the Penguins were easily the leading candidates when DreamWorks began considering a Madagascar spin-off series. Up high, boys. <laughs> this March, the Penguins are teaming up again. Sweet mercy, take cover! And coming to Nickelodeon. Go ahead, make my day. Look sharp! They're on a mission without permission. You didn't see anything. The Penguins of Madagascar, the all-new series, coming this March. You rock! Releasing just three weeks after Madagascar 2 escaped to Africa, The Penguins of Madagascar's pilot set a record as the most watched premiere in the history of Nickelodeon. Rico, kill the lights. Yes. I meant turn them off. Across its run, it scored guest stars like Neil Patrick Harris, Conan O'Brien, Melissa McCarthy, and Big Time Rush. By 2010, it was the second most watched cable animated series behind only SpongeBob. And yet, no one ever talks about it. It's a lot like Disney XD's Lab Rats in the sense that it was one of the flagship series of its respective network, highly watched, highly regarded by kids, and yet it seems to have no cultural legacy whatsoever. When you Google the Penguins of Madagascar, the only results are the 2014 movie, and you have to scroll down to find anything about the show. There is no Penguins of Madagascar fandom. There are no YouTube videos about the Penguins of Madagascar. Oh, editor's note, I guess there is one. Hi, Jordan Fringe! The occasional Penguins of Madagascar meme you see out in the wild is always from the movies. Like, literally in all of my years online, I've only ever seen one from the show. Give to me your peanuts. When I was in early elementary school, I had two very clear-cut favorite shows. Phineas and Ferb and The Penguins of Madagascar. And tell me, which one of those do I bring up in just about every single video I've ever done? Mostly through Phineas and Ferb, where she played Isabella. Candace, hey, in a Phineas and, and Phineas and Ferb episode where she has to delete photos from The Jeremy. voice actress of Phineas and Ferb. There's a reference Mom. to Aglets, pre-Phineas and Ferb. Like Holly the fireside girl every once in a while. Phineas and, and Phineas. Ferb slap. And which one of those have I mentioned, I think, once ever? The concept of spy penguins really popped off in the early 2000s. So what happened to this show? Penguins of Madagascar never even got to finish its run. The last several episodes were shelved for years and then just slowly sprinkled silently onto Nicktoons well after the show had faded from syndication already. Most fans who watch the show obsessively on Nickelodeon have probably never even seen the finale. I think this is the most excited I've been for a video ever because it's time to rewatch this entire series and chart plainly and clearly for all of you the rise and fall of the Penguins of Madagascar. And now, DreamWorks, the Penguins of Madagascar. Hello everyone, it's me, King Julian, saying remember to subscribe to, to, to the channel. Let's briefly return to 2005. The DVD release of Madagascar contained a 10 minute short called The Madagascar Penguins in A Christmas Caper. Not the Penguins of Madagascar, but the Madagascar Penguins, because they hadn't settled on the branding yet. Except before the events of the movie, Private sets out to find a present for Ted the Lonely Polar Bear to cheer him up on Christmas Eve. Unfortunately, an old woman mistakes him for a squeaky toy and abducts him, forcing the other penguins to rescue him from her apartment and her ferocious dog, Mr. Chu. Come on, boys! The short introduces a number of elements that would go on to become hallmarks of the show. Wolski. Analysis. Chief among them being the penguin's secret lair inside their habitat. Rico can now cough up a lot more than a paperclip, and it doesn't seem to be a struggle for him. A number of 3D models and assets from this short will get reused as well. Their base, for one, this dynamite, you get it. Things start to look familiar. A Christmas caper truly feels like episode zero. Whether intentional or not, the short functions as a proof of concept for what a Penguins of Madagascar series could be, and would be three years later. Glenn! Glenn! Glenn!
Shortly after wrapping production on Disney's Kim Possible, creators Bob Shuley and Mark McCorkle signed on to develop The Penguins of Madagascar, and expand upon the characterizations of the cast from their limited appearance in the 2005 movie. The Penguins of Madagascar abandons the celebrity stunt-casted main protagonists of the movie, but maintains all of the ancillary characters. The theme song details the penguins inspecting a new arrival at the Central Park Zoo, only to learn that it's King Julian, Maurice, and Mort, the lemurs. These are the seven characters we follow in just about every episode, along with newcomer Marlene the Otter, an often unwilling ally of the penguins. The episodes aired as 30-minute blocks, usually with two 11-minute segments in each. However, there were a small handful of 22-minute specials and one 44-minute special. There isn't any sort of strict episode formula in this series, there's actually a lot of variety, but I would say a general pattern you might see is we follow the penguins on some high-priority mission, often caused by and usually hindered by the lemurs. For example, here's a recap of three classic Season 1 episodes. In Operation Plush and Cover, brand new Mort dolls have become extremely popular around the zoo. A jealous Julian decides to dump them all in the skunk habitat, prompting a recall. Unfortunately, Mort falls in a box. The penguins ship themselves to the toy factory in order to rescue him. I told Harry to his face that I'm going to write him up next time he's late. Hey, I know everything that goes on around here. Everything! Of course, Julian has shipped himself express and beaten them there, so he can get some credit for helping as well. They have to avoid all kinds of dangerous machinery and equipment in this toy destruction chamber. <laughs> but ultimately bring Mort home. But whoops, looks like they'll have to do the whole adventure over again. Private. Hello? Anybody? In Penguiner Takes All, the penguins play Capture the Flag as combat training. Julian arrives and insists they let him play with them. Then hounds Skipper day and night until he relents. <laughs> the lemurs inexplicably win. Skipper begs for a rematch, prompting loss after loss after loss as the penguins bet away more and more of their possessions until they're flat broke. <coughs> oh, nothing left, even inside Rico. But Skipper has an epiphany and deduces that the lemurs have been cheating and hopping through the trees in order to win. So we get one last winner-takes-all rematch, and the penguins create soda rocket jetpacks, to claim the skies as their own, and they prove victorious once and for all. They take back all their possessions, and Julian's entire kingdom, and Mort. Or lastly, in Go Fish, Alice, the uncaring zookeeper, has replaced all the penguins' fish with dry crackers containing nutritional supplements. With Pinky the Flamingo acting as an eye in the sky, the penguins embark on a mission to steal actual fish from a moving truck during a traffic stop. Sorry, Skipper. I don't know how the holiday snaps got in there. This gentleman is our target. One standard rest. Oh. One standard restaurant grade fish truck. Julian, who hates the stench of fish, embarks on a counter operation to stop the penguins from succeeding. Upon returning home, we get this iconic interaction, dare I say. Which is why I switched the crates before you even got back to the zoo. What you didn't see coming is that I am actually you. <gasps> then by processing of elimination, I must be you. Maybe, maybe. But if you are me and I am you, then we must both be. Enough! It turns out that in the end, Pinky duped everyone and got all of the fish for herself. Penguins of Madagascar firmly operates in a cartoon universe. This is just what happens at a toy recall factory. The penguins have to maintain their cover as covert agents, but they'll freely enjoy a bouncy castle in their habitat in the middle of the day. That is the show's only concern, just being entertaining, not necessarily making sense. Before diving into the series proper, I actually want to circle back and discuss how the penguins changed in adaptation. The main difference is that in the movies, they are trying to escape the zoo. They're trying to go to Antarctica, and after that first movie, they're just exploring the world wherever they want to go. 
In the show, they never question the zoo as their home. They have their HQ here, is the entire center of their operations, and they seemingly have no desire to ever leave. Without a feature budget, the animation is considerably less detailed. No individual feathers or fur, no gleans in the character's eyes. I think there's also far less of an effort to make them move like real penguins, which is where a lot of the humor came from in the movie. CG from children's programming of this era has something of a habit of aging very poorly. But I don't think Penguins of Madagascar looks bad, honestly. I think it still holds up by modern standards. There's definitely a degree of stiffness in the earlier episodes, this uncomfortable rubber quality to how the characters move. But as tends to be the case, it's vastly improved by the end of the series. In the original Madagascar movie, all four penguins were voiced by directors and producers at DreamWorks, who frequently provide cameos a la Pixar's John Ratzenberger. We're digging to Antarctica! Ooh, what a lovely bed. Gotcha! But I can't make it out. You're not a king yet. <laughs> that button launches all of our nuclear missiles! On the left side of the plane, you can see we're approaching fabulous Las Vegas. I assume the DreamWorks employees were unprepared for how popular these penguins would become, because they had, like, three, five lines each in that first movie, besides Skipper. They just recorded a few lines and got back to work the same way they did in Shrek, presumably clueless as to how the penguins would resonate with people. Skipper was voiced by legendary director Tom McGrath, who I just mentioned, who directly helmed many of the studio's movies, including Madagascar, Boss Baby, and Megamind. The kitty loves the fishy. Private was voiced by Christopher Knights. I did it! Kowalski was voiced by Chris Miller, not that Chris Miller. We've broken our last shovel. And Rico was voiced by Jeffrey Katzenberg, the founder of the Quibi streaming service? Apparently the Quibi guy worked at DreamWorks and founded it. Who knew? Hey, hey. Tom is the only movie penguin who signed onto the series, and I'm actually very grateful for that, because I could not imagine anyone else voicing him. Here's your tip, delivery human. No one to walk away, no one to run. I normally prefer giving voice roles to actual voice actors. Skipper is pretty much the only character Tom's ever played. But the manic energy and this relentless intensity in his voice is so unparalleled and so specific. I don't like it. What do you make of it, Kowalski? It could be anything. Oh, really? Could it be Alaska? No, it's probably not a- Are you saying Alaska might be stuck upside down to the clock tower of my zoo? I guess. Because I think people would notice if the entire state of Alaska just packed up and moved to the zoo. In the show, Skipper is a lot more paranoid. He sees enemies in every corner. His plans have bizarre motives and executions. There's just a lot more screws loose in his head in the show than in the movie. We're gonna scale this skyscraper even if it takes us days to reach the summit. Actually, I think the door's open in half an hour. No time! James Patrick Stewart, not that Patrick Stewart, takes over the role of private and does a rock solid impression of knights. Are all British people named Patrick Stewart? His demeanor and characterization remain largely identical. Skipper! I felt him kick, and then he smiled at me! James Patrick Stewart came and talked to my high school's theater class the year before I arrived as a student, so all of the upperclassmen would occasionally talk about how they got to meet the voice of Private, and it's not fair. Voiceover legend Jeff Bennett takes over the role of Kowalski, and he notably does a completely different voice than Miller did. Try to conserve oxygen by shutting down any unnecessary brain functions. Here he's redefined as an inventor, a quirky mad scientist who makes failed device after failed device. The readings from my hound hunter indicate that there are possible design flaws. The end result is a lot more energetic and more unhinged. And as a kid, I deeply preferred this TV show version of Kowalski. Although I will say I have a newfound appreciation for Miller's blunt, matter-of-fact delivery. And on that note, Jeff Bennett voices just about everything and everyone in this entire show. Panic button lockdown initiated. I got a date with Destiny, mister. We're here live at the Central Park Zoo. You are correct. From the jackpot, did we? It is essential that they stay in the study area. Some duty on the suity. <laughs> Luckily, I have met Jeff Bennett, and he voice acted in my Transformers Among Us meme one time. Sussy bucka. Kian. Good luck with the meme. Shout out to Jeff. The one and only John DiMaggio now voices Rico. Rico is now a psychopath and he can speak in gibberish. 
He can vomit up all kinds of violent weapons of any size. <laughs> Something worth noting is that Rico speaking John DiMaggio gibberish was introduced in a Christmas caper. <laughs> While the movies abandoned this idea and continued to use Katzenberg's audio, hey, hey. the TV show continues this characterization. Rico, I'm gonna need a claw hammer, 16 roofing nails, and a presidential pardon. Sacha Baron Cohen was not going to do a Nickelodeon show for four years, so King Julian was recasted with an impression artist by the name of Danny Jacobs. As a kid, I always paid attention to credits, and so I assumed that this Danny Jacobs was the very same as Phineas and Ferb's main composer, song producer, Danny Jacob, but now I can see that they are in fact different people, and they do in fact have different names. Comedian Andy Richter stayed on as Mort, and legendary voiceover artist Kevin Michael Richardson continued his portrayal of Maurice, only a feather in the cap of one of the broadest portfolios of all time. Nicole Sullivan rounds out the cast as Marlene. As a kid, I always wondered where this took place in the timeline. It obviously can't take place before the movies, given the presence of the lemurs. Madagascar 2 had just come out, and at the time, the most logical assumption was that the show took place after the movies. Celebrity animals have returned to the wild, and the penguins have returned to the zoo. But in 2012's Madagascar 3, the penguins do not return to the zoo and continue roaming the world into their 2014 movie. The show will occasionally reference the movie very loosely, but as a whole, it's a paradox, and they cannot coexist with each other, and we'll cover more reasons as we go on. In the words of DreamWorks executive Tom McGrath referring to the TV show, is not specifically before or after the movie, I just wanted them all back at the zoo. I think of it as taking place in a parallel universe. I wish I knew that as a kid, because I spent a pointlessly large amount of time questioning the logistics of the Madagascar timeline. So for the record, there are two continuities. One is the Penguins of Madagascar TV show, and the other is everything else. The Penguins are written every bit as strongly in the show as they are in the movie. And this close to 30 hours of content has a lot of very entertaining moments. <laughs> Skipper, how long will it take to saw through the bracelet? The bracelet? I was just gonna saw off my foot. But maybe you're onto something there, Private. They have these ridiculous, absurd plans that make absolutely no sense, but they're always so convinced that they're gonna work. And then they do. If anyone asks, your name is Frosty Fun Times Ice Cream Truck number 26. You were trained as a laundry service vehicle, but on your 18th birthday, you decided to follow your dream and never look back. With his stunning disguise as cover, he'll embed himself in baboon society. He'll live among them for weeks, months, years. They'll navigate New York using a map of Italy and still inexplicably get to their destination. It is a map of New York. Uh, it is a map. The fact that the penguins commit so hard is what makes the comedy work as well as it does. We'll need a large crate, 10 million Deutschmarks, and a C-17 cargo jet on the runway in 15 minutes. I might need 30 minutes on the jet. Last man. That could jeopardize the whole mission. The key to the penguins working is that they're all delusional. Kowalski will establish that some of their files have been declassified only for Skipper to complain about the bureaucrats who did it. These files are declassified now. Pinhead pencil pushers, they have no idea! Like, who else declassified these files if not one of them? Then Marlene opens the files and has a bunch of crude crayon drawings. But to the penguins, it's real. They insist that they're undetectable and they leave no trace in any of their operations, despite the fact that is so laughably not true. When we operate, we're invisible. Like ghosts. <laughs> they leave a blazing trail of destruction everywhere they go. They get all of their intel from children's books and pamphlets that they pick up around the zoo, and they consider it all of it fully top secret. According to Scratch and Sniff Rainforest Animals, Barry is a poison dart frog. They're elite agents of destruction, and yet they are completely illiterate the duotronic laser targeting system and the spectral demagnetizer. At least I think that's what these labels say. Hard to tell when you can't read. At least most of the time. The Kowalski did just read a scratch and sniff book. When the gag needs them to be able to read, they occasionally can. But if not, they'll default to asking Mason and Phil the chimps for translation. Something I appreciate is that all of their technology is very clearly just built from random objects they found. Their car and their planes are just remote control toys. Rico's girlfriend is a little girl's doll. 
Something a little bit odd is that sometimes the objects are scaled to humans and other times they're scaled to the penguins. Like Rico might vomit up an inexplicably tiny penguin sized chainsaw or Skipper might get tiny toilet paper stuck to his foot. Like what is this a three by three inch square? Why would that exist? It almost feels like there was no consistent scale chart for any of the objects and various storyboard artists slash animators just drew slash scaled these objects to whatever size they felt like for the shots they were doing. Because these objects will be changing size between shots sometimes. Although on the note of the penguins technology being randomly scrapped together by common objects, the show will eventually kind of lose track of that. The team gets along incredibly well. Across over 150 episodes, not a single plot is fueled by the penguins interpersonal conflicts. There's no moment where the penguins argue with each other None of them seem to have any real problems with each other's personalities. Like occasionally Skipper might need Rico to dial back his insanity, or he might get on Kowalski's case about his failed inventions, but it's like always for the sake of the mission. It's never ever personal, I've noticed. While the penguins hold up to my childhood memories, I regret to inform you that the show's primary conflict drivers, the lemurs, do not. Uh, they are characters who I think offer very little in terms of entertainment value for an adult. But Boris, come! <laughs> Mort is a completely one-note character. He's here to be cute, obsess over King Julian's feet, and shout random non-sequiturs. Any questions? Is purple a vegetable? You call that mindless? <laughs> Check out our guy. I ought to talk to ukulele hamster! Ring tail! Santa! Tree! Animals! Confused potato! You know, as a kid, I'm sure I ate it up, but it just feels so cheap now. There's just no context for any of it. It's not, like, clever. I feel like they were trying to bring Ralph Wiggum energy to Mort, but it takes a lot to be Ralph Wiggum. Hi, Lisa! Hi, Super Nintendo Chalmers! Every four episodes or so, Mort will try to touch the feet, and then that's the joke. Just over and over and over, no variation, he gets kicked off the end. And, and it gets old. And that wasn't even a thing in the movie. There's one scene where Mort cries around Julian's ankle. <laughs> Get up, Mort. Do not be near the king's feet, okay? Mort wasn't trying to touch the foot or anything, but this show's creative team decided to expand that into a foot fetish, but then not do anything entertaining with it. There's a later Madagascar spinoff show called All Hail King Julian. I've never seen it, but I've seen clips, and Mort is absolutely insane. He's this dangerous, conniving gremlin, and the most powerful character in the show. Like, they didn't have Rico there, so they dropped him more into the Rico role and amped him up to 11. Secrets are what the voices in my head say never to tell until I'm sure no one can stop me. And to me, this is a wildly superior version of Mort to the one I grew up with, and it makes it retroactively harder to appreciate this one. And I feel like there were shades of this in the Madagascar movies, but it just got stripped away when developing the Penguins of Madagascar. Maurice has a different problem. While he's never annoyed me, I've noticed that his personality is completely malleable. He's a totally different character episode to episode. Usually he's a lot more self-aware than Julian and can see exactly what's going on, but other times he'll be dumb enough to mistake an elephant for an ice cream truck if the script calls for it. In some episodes, Maurice is the most loyal servant, King Julian's strongest soldier. Other times he can't stand Julian's guts. They're like two completely different aspects of his personality that he switches between depending on what the story's about. And I've noticed that because Maurice is usually the most knowledgeable character in any given scene, his primary purpose is just to explain things. Almost all he does is deliver exposition to the other characters and the audience. That's a water main. I wouldn't do that. There's a lot of pressure in those things. That's a yo-yo. You do tricks with it. To me, Maurice does not feel like one cohesive character. If the episode isn't about his being annoyed by Julian, he'll have a huge smile on his face and support King Julian in the fullest. And then there's Julian, who never shuts up. Oh, who cares about the brain-eating hair monster? Why are you still talking about the brain-eating hair monster? You're all like, blah, 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 the brain-eating hair monster! I'm done with the brain-eating hair monster! You see, the real problem is that Maurice is getting foot pampering, but I am not. He has a moment like this in at least every other episode. He just goes on and 
on, 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 I hear you got a tiny annoying lemur down here. Springtail? Eh, uh, what's all this then, Gavna? Oh, I declare, I would love to see a lemur expensive diamond talk. So what say you cow pokes rustle up that string, howdy? Robot President approves his message. Sniff, squeak, skitter, skitter. Yeah, that's my rat, you know, for the home crowd. Just shut up, you're so annoying! He selfishly causes so many of the problems the penguins have to fix. He shows up in almost every episode for, like, no reason. When the penguins are out in the city hunting a ghost bus, guess what? Julian's in the city that night too, sewer fishing. When the penguins steal a relic from a museum, oh, turns out the lemurs are there too. When Private learns how to weaponize cuteness, we'll cut back to the lemurs every two minutes as Julian tries to make Mort unlock that same power. They don't contribute to the plot most of the time. They just show up for Julian to talk. <laughs> I thought this was where we steal the other camp's mascot. What? Are you completely weak? Oh, I'm not. Camping! Oh, somebody's working on his sourpuss grumpy grouch activity patch. <laughs> it's you, by the way. Like, don't get me wrong, he he has his moments. He, he's made me laugh. Maurice, you will be like the famous Davy Crockett at the Alamo. I will be like the guy nobody ever heard of because he lived. I don't hate him or anything, but... Julian, I can see clearly, is a character designed to entertain eight-year-olds, not college graduates. They interrupted the show with a very important message. Breaking news? Yes, very broken. Watching the show now, I wish that some of the lemur screen time had been given to Marlene. I love Marlene. She's so chaotic, so scatterbrained, but so competent and rational at the same time. Like, she's layered. She's very entertaining. Exactly, exactly. And you're not afraid of me, are you? In the zoo? Or out of the zoo. Hey, <laughs> you're funny. Come on! No! No! And yet she's barely ever in the show. I remembered her featuring way more prominently, but she's like in a third of the episodes at most, and a lot of those are just one line in crowd scenes. I want to go to Paris. A Spanish guitar! Ooh, that plays itself! <clears throat> Across this entire series, I can only think of three instances where Marlene went on a mission or an operation with the penguins and got to have a hero moment. Melt your ugly face, squid guy! Stop melting! That would be slugs. This show's gender ratio is, is so laughably bad, but in the show's defense, the movie uh, caused that problem. <laughs> so something I found fascinating while editing and circling back to these earliest episodes is seeing how the voices evolved. Tom McGrath starts with this grounded, modest portrayal of Skipper, akin to the first Madagascar movie, but he gradually grows a lot as a voice actor, and by the end of the show, he is so lively all the time. It's great. Well, boys, it's gonna be ice cold sushi for breakfast. Look alive, men. Time to get us some popcorn. And now that I have my favorite mug, I'll be leaving now. Don't worry about me, you've got Commander Kowalski. The recast characters sound way closer to the originals in the very beginning of the show. But by the end, they shift into kind of their own thing as the voice actors really make the characters their own. It's no good, Skipper. I don't know the codes. Skipper. Our bag sprung a leak. They fired Chuck Charles? We're only 500 feet from the main sewer line. Bit on the nose, isn't it, Skipper? Is Unan Quadium a noble gas? <laughs> it totally is. <laughs> so, my genius plan is this. Excuse me, fishy interrupting bird. Your king, which is me, is very busy. Or does it make so much sense it hurts your face? If we rescue this perky princess and return her to Glamortonia... And meanwhile, the experienced voice actors who came in, who built these characters from the ground up, Nicole Sullivan's Marlene or John DiMaggio basically invented the way Rico sounds, they stay identical across the entire series. They had it pinned from the beginning. Bad boy! Hey! Or, or, is it a cornado? <laughs> Bunch of jokesters. 
Besides the eight leads, aka the seven leads and Marlene, the show has a wide variety of recurring characters. Prominent fellow zoo inhabitants include Bata and Bing, the Mafia Gorillas, Joey, the angry kangaroo, I'm gonna clobber you till your ovaries make like a necklace, Roy, the dramatic rhino, You'll never play another prank again, buddy boy. Leonard the terrified koala. Your helping isn't helpful, so don't help. And Bert the dim-witted elephant. Wow! It's like looking in a mirror! John DiMaggio plays him and does this super nasally voice like it's coming from way up in his trunk and I just, I think that's a really funny character choice he made. As far as their allies go, the most prominent is probably Fred, the derpy squirrel. Bacon? <laughs> what? Oh, no, thank you, Fred. I'm not hungry. What? No, I was just asking if you think this is an acorn. I loved Fred so much as a kid. Even my sister liked him, and she didn't watch the show with me. I have a childhood memory of a camping trip. This would have been like 2012 or 2011, summer. And there was this squirrel who'd keep coming up to our campsite, and my sister and I named it Fred. I'm not sure why our parents let us feed a wild squirrel with our mouths. Almost everyone else shows up like two to three times per season. There's Roger, a sewer alligator who everyone thinks is a scary monster in his first appearance, though they quickly learn he's a kind-hearted, silly man. I was just a baby at the time, but you know, you change, you grow, next thing you know, you flush down the toilet. They work with him semi-regularly, and he's actually moved into the zoo early in the second season. Eggy is a duckling from a nearby pond who the penguins take care of for a day before he hatches. This turns him into a hardened commando toddler. Something I noticed, I think Tara Strong like forgets the voice she was doing as Eggy, because it just abruptly changes midway through the show. We live by a code of honor, sir. Hello, Mr. Skipper Silly Penguin! And Max is an alley cat behind Central Park who tries to eat the penguins at first, but eventually becomes their friend. As far as recurring villains go, we have the Sewer Rats, led by the Rat King. They're kind of the basic bitch villains where you're like, Oh hey, it's them, but you're not like, excited. You know, they're like the, the beagles. They're the Goombas of the, of the penguins of Madagascar. How are we supposed to spread pestilence with all this noise? Officer X is an unhinged animal control agent armed to the brim with bizarre equipment who will stop at nothing to capture largely any animal he runs into outside the confines of the zoo walls. Especially the penguins. He's the only human in the series who the penguins struggle to take down on their own. X, is that the name your mommy gave you? Mother never told me my real name. Said it was classified. At one point, his animal control truck projects a laser, cuts a hole in the ground, and pursues the penguins through the sewers. That's who we're dealing with here. He's fired from animal control after season one, and shows up with a different profession in all subsequent appearances. Hello, penguin. Long time, no satisfying revenge. Oh. Officer X! Actually, I'm guessing it's now Fishmonger X! <laughs> Throughout the first chunk of the show, Skipper occasionally mentions that he's been banned from Denmark. Looks like they finally tracked me down! Those Danes really know how to hold a grudge. This leads to the introduction of Skipper's rival Hans the Puffin who is just John DiMaggio at his John DiMaggiist. You should know that I kissed your sister! On the lips! I don't have a sister. Really? Then who did I kiss? And lastly, Skipper occasionally mentions his arch rival, Dr. Blowhole, in the first season. Mad dolphin nemesis, Dr. Blowhole. He blew out the sun! We soon get to meet Dr. Blowhole, voiced by Neil Patrick Harris. I will rule land and sea! <laughs> <laughs> to this day, I only know Neil Patrick Harris as the voice of Dr. Blowhole. Like, I know he's famous and I know he's been in other things. I don't know what any of them are off the top of my head. At one point in a bookstore, I saw he did a choose your own autobiography uh, story. And I thought that was uh, silly, but not silly enough to purchase it. So I know Neil Patrick Harris for his autobiography and Dr. Blowhole. I'll recap all of this wonderful man's appearances soon, don't you worry. But first, let's just dive into some season one episodes I would like to explore. The first season as produced consisted of 26 22 minute episodes. These were split into 50 11 minute segments 
and one 22-minute special. A personal favorite is All Choked Up. Alice sees Rico vomiting and force-feeds some medicine to prevent upchucking. Unfortunately, there's an active bomb in Rico's stomach that's counting down to detonation. After exhausting all options to remove it and saying their dramatic goodbyes, I know I'm not good with words, Rico. And, uh, well, either you, really, but I just want to say... You are my brother! They have the idea to send Mort inside Rico to defuse the bomb. Hey, there's bomb gone down here! Mort, you need to get to the bottom of the stomach. Down the spiral staircase? Take the elevator, it's quicker. Mort's able to do it just in the nick of time, and the bomb happens to destroy their military target for the day anyways. In previous appearances, Rico was coughing things up. This episode shifts the vernacular and establishes that Rico is vomiting things up rather than coughing. In The Hidden, a new animal at the zoo seems to be abducting the other characters one by one. The penguins go to investigate, and Kowalski has to learn to trust his instincts as his teammates are taken away one by one. It turns out that the new inhabitants were just harmless chameleons who simply wanted to have a party but didn't have a way to communicate that. Did I win? Sure. Symbolically. For some reason, the chameleons and just the chameleons can't speak. Frogs can speak, grasshoppers can speak, cockroaches can speak, snails can speak, hornets can speak. I think you're fake! But not the chameleons. The source of the give to me your penis meme is Mort Unbound. Mort gets kicked right in the path of Kowalski's size increasing super ray. <laughs> heavens! What are you? King Julian, at first, doesn't notice anything unusual about him, but then decides to use Mort to bully all the other animals into giving him their food. Your peanuts. Sorry, I don't have any. Ah, oh, check the trunk. Okay! But Mort soon goes out of control and KOs all the penguins when they try to feed him an antidote serum. Gimme banana! <laughs> what is? Do something? Like give him a banana? Don't be ridiculous. He's only able to be stopped when Private grows to massive size as well, putting Mort in his place and forcing him to drink the serum. Then the problem starts all over again. Private likes big. That, that happens a lot. An episode that I remember like never airing is Tagged. I have no clue if it actually aired less often, but that's just what it felt like to me. The zoo animals are suffering from sub-zero winter conditions. Captivity moment. And the penguins sneak off to the furnace to turn up the zoo's heat. Unfortunately, they're forced to rush home to avoid suspicion from Alice before Kowalski can relieve the steam pressure. They're put under house arrest for a wildlife researcher who's come to study them. Better men than this guy have tried to make me tough. Help! The penguins launch a walkie-talkie into the lemur kingdom for help, and they walk them through the process of stopping the heat buildup and preventing the entire zoo from exploding. You should see seven different knobs. Red, crimson, scarlet, brick, cardinal, ruby, and rose. Make absolutely certain that you twist only the scarlet knob. Meanwhile, the penguins try to act as penguiny and non-suspicious as they possibly can. But we only know the smile and wave routine. What else do penguins do? I don't have the faintest. Julian's forced to step up and save the zoo. Then an explosion inexplicably erupts from the plastic volcano, which is apparently linked to the furnace system. And in the episode Kingdom Come, Maurice gets addicted to crack cocaine. <laughs> There's an episode from childhood that I specifically recall, and I was very curious to see how it might age. It's Misunderstanding, the episode where Skipper becomes a woman. At the zoo, this ugly simpering nerd won't shut the hell up. Listen, kid, all I know is we've got three males and a female. The birds know which is which. Um. With their genders drawn into question, Kowalski invents a DNA machine. After donating saliva, Private Kowalski and Rico receive a male plus, but Skipper gets a minus. He's a girl. Skipper immediately burned through all five phases of grief. Private, how's about we trade DNA results? Come on. Skipper, I don't think that's how it- And then immediately comes to accept and even embrace it. Well, I guess you gotta play the hand you're dealt. Rico, hit me with a pretty pink bow. <laughs> However, Skipper's new gender proves to be a hassle on the gang's commando missions. What's the holdup? Hang in there, Skipper. I I'm sure the zoo must have a ladies' room somewhere. You know, we could just stop and ask for directions. Skipper decides her feminine persona is hampering the team. 
So she resigns. I'm walking out of here a confused, naive little girl. And I'm not coming back till I've learned to be a real woman. She seeks advice from Marlene on how to properly be a girl. And Marlene tells her that a girl can do anything she wants to do. If commando operations make her happy, then she can do it, even if she's a girl. When an electrical surge endangers the lemurs and the boys are neutralized, Skipper is forced to leap into action and save the day. Her teammates now truly appreciate her value and welcome her back to the unit. Upon seeing a blown fuse caused by the blender problem, Kowalski realizes their fuse must have blown too. Upon restoring power, the machine whirs to life and completes Skipper's cross. Meaning he has been a boy all along, and Alice simply doesn't know what she's talking about. The end. I'm a real boy after all! Yes! <laughs> Something you should know is that, as a kid, as of season one, this was my absolute favorite episode. And I'm I am don't, I don't feel like unpacking that right now. This was my favorite episode as a kid, and I have a very specific memory tied to it. When I was a child, I liked to write pointlessly long stories about whatever the hell I wanted. I would often write such stories for class, and sometimes I would just recount the plots of episodes I watched on TV and turn those in as assignments. And I know for a fact that in second grade, I wrote the plot of this episode and turned it in. The question is, does that still exist? So I drove back to my hometown, and me and my mom looked through the attic for all of my papers, assignments, and drawings from elementary school. I found lots and lots of fan art of Lego sets, Tokyo Mater, the car's short, just that one specifically, the heroic agents of Club Penguin's Elite Penguin Force, and Phineas and Ferb. I had an incredible idea as a kid. What if Phineas and Ferb had a crossover with Marvel? I had an incredible idea as a kid. What if Phineas and Ferb had a crossover with Star Wars? I was ripped off Twice. I forgot I was holding an SD card. If I had a nickel for every time. Okay, but Rover as the Adat, you have to admit I cooked with this. It's my fish hooks fan fiction. <laughs> After a whole afternoon of searching, I wish I could have recorded my reaction. We found it. I told you, young elderly mother, that we would find it. Here it is. There was a school class visiting the zoo and a boy saying facts about penguins. The zookeeper came and said, we have three miles and one female. The penguins all thought they were boys. Cal Whiskey made a DNA machine and the results were surprising. Skipper the leader was a girl. Skipper got a bow, but she was not good at their missions. The penguins ran through the zoo with their little car. Julian the Limer asked, why he did not have a bow like Skyper? How come I do not have a pretty pink bow? Anyway, why can't my smoothie work? Asked Julian. It is broken, said Warris. Okay, plan H, sighed Julian. Let us move to plan H. Mort go down to the underground electrical station and start unplugging things and start plugging them into other things, said Julian. Now start pulling things out of other things and putting them into new things. Mort did it, but then he got electrocuted. Skipper was at Marlion the Otter's house to learn how to be a girl. Then there was a loud noise. Should you get that? No, it's danger, yes. Let's stay here and gossip about boys. How about we stay here and gossip about boys? Marlion pulled him there. I can't read this, Kian. I cannot believe my teacher was transphobic. Also, she forgot a comma. I'm gonna have to mark her down for that. The electrical cords were attacking. Julian, Mort, Warris, Kalwaski, Privat, and Rico. The Pinegins and the Lammers. Skipper got the bow off his head and wrapped it around the cords. What about my smoothie machine? Asked Julian. Then Kalaski knew that DNA machine made the power hog. The DNA analyzer was the power hog. And the female minus was an unfinished male plus. Female minus was really an unfinished male plus. Skipper was a boy the end. I'm a boy. I'm a boy. <laughs> Did you like it? We looked for this for two hours. I've been recapping episodes of TV shows since the second grade. I was born to be a YouTuber. The funniest thing to me is that <laughs> I never once misgendered Skipper. It's almost impossible to analyze this episode through any sort of meaningful cultural lens. It's just a montage of sexism jokes, and then the, the last two minutes, a message that girls can do anything they want. Boy, girl, 
All that really matters is how well you use a pink bull whip in a crisis situation. Ooh, wait. See, I don't think that was really the lesson. I... You could argue, mayhaps, that it's pro-trans because Skipper embraces her identity immediately, as does everyone around her. You could argue that it's anti-trans because Skipper solely relies on DNA and genetics to determine his gender. Yes, you DNA! I think the reason that there's no clear-cut allegory is that I do not think this episode was actually intended to offer any sort of commentary <laughs> on, on transgender issues. Like here in Zack and Cody, when there's lines like this... We're wearing makeup! Not exactly the phrase a mother wants to hear from her teenage boys. <laughs> that is specifically a joke targeted at, I don't know, homosexuality, transgenderism, what, what have you. The general progressive societal movement clearly explicitly crossed the writer's mind when they wrote that dialogue. Whereas in this, I don't think there is anything in the text that can tangibly prove the writer of this episode was thinking of transgender people when writing it. Like, I think they wanted to write a women in the military story, and having Skipper become a woman was their solution to do that. I feel I can no longer serve in this unit. Um, no. well, I don't... No! Uh, yes, actually, probably yeah. should. Yeah. I don't know what specifically they were trying to accomplish here. Uh, all I know is that it's above analysis. It's above me, it's above us. It's above you, the viewer. It's, it's a wonderful episode that, if Skipper wearing this bow doesn't prove that gender is a social construct, I don't know what does. Skipper, what are you doing? Come on, lady, door, what, is chivalry dead? <laughs> Another thing I'll praise while I'm on this train of thought, Private is a gentle, caring, affectionate man, and the show never, ever makes fun of him for that. As a product of the 2000s, you'd expect a bunch of subtle adult jokes about his sexuality. After watching countless Disney Channel sitcoms, I would certainly expect that. But not a single character ever makes fun of Private. No penguin, no zoo inhabitant. Skipper, the most self-proclaimed masculine macho man, admires this about Private. He actively encourages it. They always pick Private. Adorableness is his secret weapon. I don't know if they were specifically trying to send a positive message that it's okay for boys to be sensitive, or if that's just how it wound up happening, but either way, it, it, it just aged well. Okay, you've eaten your dinner, and now it's time for dessert. We've reached Dr. Blowhole's Revenge, marketed as Operation Blowhole. On Monday, February 15th, in the first part of Penguins of Madagascar special, someone's after the penguins. <laughs> Smart. Somebody write that down. He's smart. Oh, who the heck are you? Ah! He's Dr. Blow. Did you feel that subwoofer? Who will survive? Your little buddy sleeps with the fishes. Operation Blowhole. The first ever Penguin special premieres Monday, February 15th at 8. Only on Nick. We open with a flashback to a mission in a desert. After being name dropped several times throughout the season, Blowhole reveals himself. Blowhole. Well, penguins, we meet once again. They're narrowly able to escape and thwart him, destroying his lair in the process. He vows revenge. In the present, Blowhole's been observing the penguins and he has his lobster soldiers abduct Julian, who he mistakes as Skipper's best friend. Don't play coy with me. My brain is bigger than your whole body. Look at you two. Obvious BFFs. Klosky, the code. Buffalo firefighter, no. Baby fat flinger, no. Ah! Best friends forever. You're stark raving mad! Not you, Kowalski, him. The penguins track him to his new lair on Coney Island, where he deploys a ring of fire in the North Pole. Ring of fire activated. Which he'll use to fully melt the ice caps and drown the Earth, forcing humanity to perform tricks for his entertainment, the way he did in captivity for so long. And then the planet's water levels will rise and rise and then... Jet skis for everybody! No. He unleashes his mutant monster, the Chrome Claw. Chrome Claw. 
Julian goes double agent back and forth multiple times, but ultimately saves the day and stops the ring. Blowhole vows revenge once again. So I have sort of mixed feelings on Blowhole actually existing, because I think it's funnier when Skipper keeps mentioning him, and it's still possible, still plausible, that he, he's not real whatsoever. You just named four of the eight continents. Uh, there are only seven continents. I count Atlantis. Trust me, Lemur, if you had my security clearance, you would too. Confirming he's out there peels away a layer of delusion from Skipper. But on the other hand, this show would be worse if Dr. Blowhole weren't in it. I love Dr. Blowhole, so at the end of the day, I'm okay with it. Attack! Revisiting all the Disney Channel sitcoms has been really wonderful, because they're full to the brim with really clever dialogue, amidst all the monotony and laugh tracks. Pentagon is the most secure facility in the world. Yeah, with all those sides, it'd take me all day just to find the entrance. <laughs> I'm a bit disappointed to say that, once again, Penguins of Madagascar is not as funny to me as an adult as those shows are. Most of the show's day-to-day -day operations, humor-wise, are just stuff like this. You call this mellow, mama, I'm a pretty, pretty butterfly, yeah. There's no brochure, no, no, it's a cookbook! What? Mmm, wait a minute. Ah! Uh, no, <laughs> it's a brochure. Ooh, did you know they have a cheese fountain here? What? Wow! Oh, I don't know. <laughs> it's not unfunny, but I'm not really laughing at it. Obviously, it's made for kids. Every single joke that's made me laugh will have made its way into the edit of this video. And considering the show is 26 hours long, that's not a great percentage. For super long stretches of this series, especially in the back half, I was just really bored. And I haven't felt that way for any show I've revisited thus far. As the show goes on, they start putting derpy like doo -doo 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 music cues everywhere. There's never just silence in this show, and it's very clearly a cheap tactic to maintain the short attention spans of the youth. This isn't a catastrophe. This is a catastrophe. A catastrophe. Catastrophe. Beautiful word. Catastrophe. Catastrophe. You just made that up, didn't you? Cat. Ast. Ro. Tune. Fitty. Oh. A catastrophe. Yes, I've heard that word. There's also sound effects over every little thing. <laughs> After living on Disney Channel for over a year, I was taken aback and appalled at how lowbrow Nickelodeon was willing to go how lowbrow Nickelodeon was eager to go. This show is honestly just gross. There's so much toilet humor. It's like their trump card every time they don't know how to end a scene. Although something I noticed is that every single episode with a special guest star has no toilet humor in it. Almost like they were too embarrassed to have a famous people read this in the script. There's nothing more satisfying than revisiting a show from childhood and understanding a lot of the deeper layers to it now. I know I'm the 26,000th white guy in his 20s on YouTube to say this, but the reason Spongebob holds up so well is because you relate to Spongebob and Patrick's antics as a kid and circle back as an adult to relate to Squidward's jaded cynicism. There is, I'm afraid, no equivalent in The Penguins of Madagascar. There is no deeper philosophical message you can come back and appreciate as an adult. That's okay though. But more than anything, it's fun to see adult jokes you didn't understand as a child. We had our fun. Remember when I used to push you on the swing? I was faking it. <gasps> Liar! Oh yeah? Remember this? Higher, Dad! Higher! Whee! Hey. Whee! Okay. Push harder, Dad! Come on! And I'm honestly surprised to say that Penguins of Madagascar has almost nothing. Because I feel like the Madagascar movies had a lot of that. Gently now, you just want to kiss the crab. Just a little peck. A smooch like you're kissing your sister. <laughs> Like, let's walk through it. There's a few quips here and there. My brain and my crown thingamabobby will do everything for me. Yay, 
King Julian! Except the worshipping, which Mort will do. Yay, job security! You probably don't know what job security is as a kid, but as an adult who does know what job security is, it's not like I'm, I'm heartily chortling at that one. There's an episode where the penguins meet an elite spy they all admire, who's obsessed with hunting the evil Red Squirrel. He starts suspecting everyone at the zoo as being associated with him and ordering them to be locked up. I say... Read any good books lately, punks? Red? Red? The Red Squirrel! Ah! And now I see that and I'm like, okay, communism. But it's not like mind-blowing or that wildly amusing. Here is every adult joke that I found in the whole show. Keep in mind, it's a very long show, and this isn't very many. <laughs> yes, kick me more, harder! Do the left one, and now the right one! Keep them coming, it's working! Yes, out, yes, out! Wait, that last one kind of hurt a little bit. Wednesday, blasted penguin mating calls full volume. <laughs> no effect, at least. Not on the lemurs. How you doing? Mort loves you just for your feet. <gasps> it's true! <laughs> it's so true! Your smoke and swagger won't distract me. Oh, is that so? Beautiful chicken lady. <laughs> ah, ah, oh, oh, no, ah. over it. Story of my life. Gosh, will you guys stop badgering me? <laughs> Badger? Oh, I wish you hadn't said that. Is that what you think badgers do, Marlene? Badger? <gasps> I so didn't mean it that way. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean You said it, Marlene. So you must have meant it. Calm, Becky. Find your happy space. She didn't mean to spew hateful badger stereotypes. That was Jeanette McCurdy and Victoria Justice as the voice of those badgers, by the way. Don't miss guest stars Victoria Justice. I've got this peanut butter winky here and nobody to share it with. Jeanette McCurdy. There's more where that came from. Nathan Chris. It's those penguins from the zoo. And Cherry Trainer. That was spectacular. In a morning of celebrity packed penguins premieres. Saturday, September 4th, starting at 10. Only on Nick. I feel like they wanted to have the cast of iCarly be in these episodes, but then Miranda Cosgrove declined or something, and they just had to replace her with Victoria Justice. There's a moment where Julian imagines himself in a crime procedural drama, and is this not a Simpsons reference? We got Mendoza trapped inside. Like an homage to their crime procedural parodies? Mendoza! There is actually one moment I misremembered as being an adult skewing joke. In a late season one episode, Skipper falls head over heels in love with a falcon named Kipka. In the very final 10 seconds, she vomits up Fred the squirrel, and Skipper abruptly decides they should see other people. I think we should see other people. I thought what happened is that some eggs in her nest crack open, revealing she has children. And then Skipper's immediately like, I think we should see other people. I think that would have been way funnier. Why does she have a nest if she doesn't have eggs? Birds don't just make nests to sit in for fun. Anyways, all this to say, Penguins of Madagascar doesn't quite tickle the funny bone when you're over the age of 12, which is kind of a bummer, honestly. But on the other hand, they weren't making this show for anyone over the age of 12. So in that regard, who cares? It's kind of funny. Penguins of Madagascar is only seven episodes shorter than The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody, yet this video is considerably shorter. But I didn't set out in a conscious effort to make a more condensed video. When I watch a show for a recap video, I take notes on all the little thoughts I have. Connections, implications, etc. I usually have so many notes per episode that the most logically efficient way to cover all of them is to recap each episode. Maybe say like one paragraph, Maddie and London do this, then lead into my thought on it. Then next Maddie and London do this thing, then lead into my thoughts on that. With Penguins of Madagascar, I'd sit there for hours long stretches with no notes, no thoughts in my brain. It's a lot like Lab Rats in the sense that there's just no reason to recap every individual episode because I'd have no commentary on most of them and it wouldn't be entertaining to anyone. This show is just so little of substance. It is 26 hours of Mort farting 
And that's it. It's fun to rewatch the show with a better understanding of how animation production works. It's really funny how they kind of conserve and reuse assets. Uh, obviously, I wouldn't have noticed that at age eight. Like they modeled maybe 10 kids and 10 adults for this show. So the end result is that the zoo's only guests are the same 20 or so people over and over and over and over. In Operation Plush and Cover we talked about earlier, the Mort plushies are literally just Mort's animation model. At one point there's a flashback to 100 years ago as a time capsule gets buried. And it's very obvious to me that these humans probably don't have faces modeled at all. I don't think they're even rigged, they're not moving. But then we get a distant cutaway where the crowd's clapping and it's clearly just the regular character models in every episode but they gave like two of them hats. Rico always spits up one of two chainsaws, the same flamethrower over and over. At a museum, the stuffed elephant is clearly just Bert's character model, and this green modern art cube is clearly just Jiggles, Kowalski's gelatinous monster from a couple episodes. Private's favorite snack is a peanut butter winky, but they'll occasionally use the Winkies candy wrapper for other candies, like here when gumballs drop out of it, because who's gonna notice? Why design a new candy wrapper when you already have one? One last thing that isn't animation based, there's an episode where the penguins have to save a baby's runaway stroller. And I remember being annoyed every time this came on because I felt like they showed it every day. But the baby's crying is very clearly just three noises Tara Strong made that they looped over and over and over. Eddie suggests we quiet this little noisemaker. On usually derive happiness from fun tackles. Signs of a stuffed animal. And every time a baby shows up for the rest of the series, it is in fact just this baby. Early in the run, every few episodes would have an original song, and all of them sucked ass. They were not good. A me invite Jay, Jay with me, he will stay, Jay, and then we can play, Jay, from June until May. Jay. I think they realized that too, because they phased them out pretty quickly. The series has a good score when it wants to though, just really cinematic orchestra pieces that whip out of nowhere sometimes. <laughs> And there are so many moments where they do the hardest reprise of the opening theme song. <laughs> that theme song's so good, by the way. I, I truly believe easily the best thing to come out of this entire show is the theme song. I've been humming that for 15 years, and I don't plan on stopping. The show has an absurd amount of running gags that play throughout it. Things that'll regularly get mentioned multiple times per season. Among them is Kowalski being hopelessly down bad for Doris, a dolphin who broke his heart multiple times. Don't make me show everyone the tattoo! Doris! <laughs> How many times has she given you the let's just be friends talk? Sixteen and a half. I couldn't hear the rest over my sobbing. We swam as one. I touched your gentle flipper. Then we were done. You wanted someone hipper. <laughs> Sorry, wrong footage. My personal favorite is regular references to Manfredi and Johnson, two penguins who were previously on the team before meeting a horrible, untimely demise. The cause of death is different every single time they're mentioned. That's exactly what Manfredi and Johnson said back in Ecuador. We buried what was left of them with a teaspoon. Manfredi and Johnson thought so. What was left of them came home in a manila envelope. That's just what Manfredi and Johnson asked me. Six hours before they washed up inside a thimble on Ventnor Avenue. Look what happened to Manfredi and Johnson when they fell hard for those chin strap sisters. They lost their hearts, a lung. 15 feet of intestine. Is there such a thing as a demise that's not gruesome, Skipper? Manfredi and Johnson? And the day spa incident? Oh, yes. What a relaxing way to go. <laughs> Manfredi and Johnson mistook the inside of a beluga whale for an escape tunnel. They were killed by an explosive disguised as an elephant. They were burnt alive by Chinese lanterns and six bottles of rocket fuel during a talent show. And they were taken out by Skipper himself for insubordination. And many more. A lot of running gags would go on to inspire episodes. Private sometimes mentions his Uncle Nigel, and Uncle Nigel would eventually come to visit, voiced by Peter Capaldi. Ah, and of course, ah, Auntie Polly ah, with Alan Vega absolutely refused it. Of course, I'm a spy lad. One of the Doctor Who's. Which one? Who knows, get it? Private also mentions his fear of badgers from time to time, and badgers would eventually get added to the zoo. Another great example is the show's obsession with dunking on Hoboken, New Jersey of all places. 
This snake escape really has everyone on edge, eh, Bonnie? <laughs> No, Chuck, that's just Hoboken. Every single character in the show seems to think Hoboken is like a hell on earth. Hoboken. <gasps> but I promised myself that I would never end up in Hoboken, at least not alive. I will buck out my own eyeballs. I swear to you. There's an episode where the penguins have to desperately dispose of a deadly stink bomb bioweapon and detonate it in Hoboken. And Kowalski declares, My calculations show that Stank might actually improve the air quality over New Jersey. Throughout the series, the Penguins defeated various one-off enemies by sending them to New Jersey, or transferring them to the Hoboken Zoo. Rhonda, a double agent walrus who bunked with Marlene. Savio, a boa constrictor who tried to eat the zoo animals. Clemson, a wildly entertaining, treacherous lemur who tried to steal Julian's place as king. Number one! <laughs> that means the king. <laughs> look like rain. <laughs> All of this culminates in the season two special, The Hoboken Surprise, marketed as Operation Vacation. Now, in a half hour penguin special, they're lost in a strange land. Penguins flowing out of the sky over here. And someone doesn't want them to leave. Bye-bye. Uh, yeah. Could this mission be their last? Something unspeakable must have become of the penguin. Find out in Operation Vacation. This mess is just getting started. The brand new special premieres next Saturday morning at 11, only on Nick. After a storm blows them astray on their vacation, the penguins find themselves captured in the streets of New Jersey and sent to the Hoboken Zoo, a surprising paradise where all of their enemies have turned a new leaf out of their love for the germaphobe zookeeper Francis. In the happy little land of Skipper refuses to trust her as the other penguins accept their new home one by one. The moment he finally relents, he's thrown into a dungeon, where we learn that Francis has trapped all of the actual animals down here and replaced them with one-to-one -one robotic replicas that don't leave a mess behind to create a perfectly clean zoo, which is one of the best evil plans I've ever heard in my entire life. Biomechanical androids. Copied from our own DNA, courtesy of Francis's body scanning massage chairs. I need to grapple with the logistics of the fact that these are robots that this woman coded, programmed, and yet they speak to the penguins in animal language perfectly, and they're fully understood. They do all of these activities together. This woman has these technical skills, but pursued a career as a zookeeper. For some reason, only New Yorkers are visiting the Hoboken Zoo today. The penguins team up with their bitter rivals to fight their android equivalents. The lemurs show up for no reason. It's a fun time. Something that bugged me as a kid. Rhonda, in her first appearance, spoke with this big dummy voice, but at the end we learn it was all a cover and she's an elite spy. Rat! You suck us! Rat! Shoot! 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 I have a priority one coded alert. But here she's just back to speaking with her dumb voice again, as if they were worried that kids wouldn't remember this one minute scene at the end. Or maybe she's still undercover, who knows? So let's dive into a handful of other season two episodes I enjoy. Season two was produced as 39 22 minute episodes. These were split into 66 11 minute segments, four 22-minute specials, and one 44-minute special. It's a very long season, so I just boiled this down to my top 10. RIP number 11, the one with the snail. I will not talk about you. It's About Time is an episode I remember very fondly. Kowalski invents a time machine called the Chronotron so that Skipper can travel back and slap a hippie, and they simply need to secure a vial of McGuffey M249 to finalize it. However, Private is visited by Kowalski from the future, who insists they cannot let the Chronotron get completed. So, Private goes on an offensive to destroy the MacGuffium and sabotage the project. Have you considered the dangers of a chronopath pair of ducks? <laughs> then, Skipper is visited by a second Kowalski from the future, who says the Chronotron must be completed, and Private can't be allowed to destroy the MacGuffium, sending Skipper on a contrarian operation. Yet the quantum entanglements dissipate in the presence of some photonic gobbledygook thing. Well, Which only occurs the when the tech key ones are hypercharged. I know what that's all about. Eventually, all three Kowalskis see each other, and this opens a rift in the space time continuum. I never should have created this chronotron. I had no idea. I'll go back in time and talk to Private. He'll stop me before any of this happens. If you hadn't created the chronotron, then you couldn't go back in time to tell yourself not to make it. Venom, it's really a paradox. I've got to make sure that I do invent the chronotron. Skipper. 
I'll go back in time and talk to Skipper. He's the only hope for the universe! Ah! Rico throws the Chronotron into the portal, inexplicably solving the problem. Skipper tells Kowalski to make something harmless like a snow cone machine. Snow cones. Kowalski! You maniac! So this is the one episode that has to be non-canon because they literally destroyed the Earth. Something odd is that throughout my whole childhood, I always knew this was a Planet of the Apes homage, but I've never seen Planet of the Apes. I don't know how I knew that. By far, my favorite episode as a kid, my most remembered one, was the 22 minute special, The Lost Treasure of the Golden Squirrel. A raider style quest where the penguins and the rats compete to discover an ancient cursed treasure. On Monday, July 19th, the race for the world's greatest treasure is on. A mysterious ancient map! It's classic. In a brand new penguin special. Come on! It's, it's the penguins. If you get in my way, I'm running you over. Get him! Versus the lemurs. This is real treasure, right? Not one of those. Friendship is the greatest treasure of all, dear. Versus the rats. We'll take that map. Who will reach the treasure first? Oh! <laughs> Find out in. Let's get on the road to high adventure. Finally! The lost treasure of the golden squirrel. This is gonna be good, y'all. The brand new penguin special premieres Monday, July 19th at 8. Only on Nick. When a mystical key is unearthed from a time capsule, the penguins need to figure out why the rats want it so badly. During a battle on top of Alex's golf cart, the key winds up flying into the lemur kingdom which gives them a stake in the mission as well. While Fred proves clueless, an ancient mystic spirit squirrel insists the treasure must be destroyed by one pure of heart. And all of them just assume she's Fred's grandma, which is highly racist of them. They should be ashamed. A totem reveals the hidden entrance to be in Marlene's habitat, where the whole group goes to search. Sorry, what was it exactly that you were looking for? You know, here, here in my house. No. <laughs> I'm a-okay. I calculate that I'm about halfway down. They find a map to the treasure, and Mort steals it straight out of the opening scene of Raiders. But they're pinned by the rats. They abduct Marlene, and the rest of the group is forced to make a hasty escape through Pillars of Fire. Once there, the group follows the map to Chinatown. One by one, they start looking into the eye of the key and become caught up in their deepest fantasies about what might be accomplished once they secure the treasure. As the group falls victim to brainwashed infighting, the rats take the key and enter the treasure chamber. Marlene looks into the eyes of the squirrel and sees herself surrounded by sexy otters playing Spanish guitars, leading her into a greed spiral that unlocks the massive vault. Something worth noting is that the show is firmly established. Marlene goes completely feral the moment she leaves the zoo walls, because she was raised her entire life in captivity. She just inexplicably doesn't go feral in this one episode, and I noticed that as a kid too. The penguins follow the rats into the chamber. Unfortunately, all of them are given glimpses of the treasure's power, and they start ruthlessly competing with the rats to pull as much of the gold as they can onto their side of a balance scale. Private's personal heaven is just being surrounded by child ducks, and I, I don't know why that would cost him money, that's a little concerning. Julian, upon realizing that all of his wildest fantasies are already fulfilled, comes to see clearly what must be done. He begins dumping all the treasure onto the rat side of the scale, until it's overloaded and crashes down into the lava below. Our heroes are blasted up through a pothole. They reunite, bond over their legendary adventure, and quickly flee when Skipper suggests they do it again. I always wondered, where the hell did this come from? Did squirrels build this giant treasure chamber? And if so, why? Even as a kid, I was like, has no one noticed a giant chamber of gold 20 feet under the roads of New York City? How does this ancient tunnel system have an entrance in Marlene's habitat that was clearly built there way later? Even as an elementary schooler, I was never able to suspend disbelief, and I don't know where that trait came from, but I've just always had that. I don't know why I love this one so much, because the whole treasure hunt genre has never really been my thing. I was like vaguely aware Indiana Jones existed due to Lucasfilm's mass brainwashing campaign in 2008 where all children learned about Indiana Jones against their will. And even now, I've seen the movies and I appreciate why they're beloved. Like, I think Last Crusade is a really great comedy, but I still don't like care that much about them. Which makes the Golden Squirrel feel like an anomaly in terms of my childhood interests. I think my second favorite episode of the show as a kid, once all was said and done, was Fit to Print. 
The penguins are captured in the background of a new promotional photo for the zoo's ad campaign, and they head out on a mission to scrub their presence before their cover is blown on billboards all across Manhattan. They break into the graphic designer's home, then the ad agency, with both visits ultimately worsening the situation. Skip your toe! Their final plan is to track the papers to the print shop and burn them, one by one as they come off the belt. As someone who worked in a print shop for two years, why aren't they using printers, is the first question that comes to my mind. What the hell is this? The papers are spaced out like six inches apart on a conveyor belt? <laughs> this is the most criminally time ineffective and cost ineffective print shop imaginable. The penguins get caught up in their assembly line and fail. Returning home defeated, Skipper ultimately assigns them new identities and rigs their lair to self-destruct. Kowalski, your new name is Senorita Esmeralda Ramirez. You rent snorkeling equipment to the happy turistas in Puerto Vallarta. Rico, you now teach advanced linguistics at the University of Chicago. At the promo unveiling, it turns out their ink-smeared print shop escapade inexplicably became the zoo's marketing campaign. Somehow, and the penguins realize everything will be okay after all. Self-destruct in three... Two, one. Another one where I'm not really sure why this was my favorite. Like for 10 years, my mind went straight to this episode whenever I thought of penguins in Madagascar. And like, I don't know, it's fine. It's, it's good, but it's not like S tier. In the episode Wishful Thinking, Private discovers a magical fountain that grants any wish to its users. Skipper says a weapon this powerful has to remain on the down low, but Julian tells the entire zoo about its existence, leading to rampant wish-making. Alice starts to notice things going awry, and that's when it all goes to hell. Wish I knew what the story was with those penguins. Ah! Ah! <laughs> the, the penguins! They've got a whole secret lair down there! With weapons! As the government arrives to apprehend them, Private makes one last ditch wish in desperation, wishing none of this had ever happened and setting everything back to the beginning. In this episode, Skipper's one wish was for a fake mustache he could use for recon. Despite the events of this episode getting erased, Skipper somehow uses the mustache in a future episode. For some reason, I barely remember this. Just a couple lines near the beginning with the fountain were familiar to me, but not the ending where they're hunted by the government. And speaking of Alice, here's a piece of information that is fundamentally life-altering to me when I learned this like a week ago. She was voiced by Mary Shear, AKA Freddy's mom from Ike Harley. Freddy, you didn't sign the shampoo agreement. How do I know if you double pooed? If you're gonna panic, panic toward the exit. Work order contains my favorite penguin operation in this entire show. We start with them saving a nest from falling out of a tree and discover they've been monitoring every single nest in the entirety of Central Park. And I love that in their minds, this is just their responsibility. If they don't monitor every single nest in Central Park, who will? Unfortunately, Private crash lands his RC plane and ruptures a water main. The zoo hires a contractor named Gus to come repair the hole. If he digs down to repair the pipe, he will hit the penguins' thermonuclear reactor and blow up Manhattan. So the penguins do everything they possibly can to deter him from digging, doing it themselves, then breaking his tools, then overheating and freezing him. But he's relentless. I did find one more paper that I wrote. I don't remember which grade's shoebox I pulled this out of. I would guess this is... A little later, because I'm spelling things correctly, the handwriting's better, I would say maybe this third grade? Fourth? But I drew a diagram of their whole base here, and I'm pretty sure this yellow thing is the thermonuclear reactor from this episode. That's what it looks like to me if I'm interpreting this schematic correctly. This was my essay about the logistics of their base. It was funny, I watched the show and little details stick out to me. There's an episode where they mention that they have 14 escape tunnels as they're digging their 15th. We already have 14 escape tunnels. Isn't that enough? And I wrote that down. I was like, ooh, 15 escape tunnels. Well, I guess I noticed that at the time too, there are dozens of escape tunnels. <laughs> and look at that. They're throwing little fish at the penguins straight out of the episode, go fish. Smile and wave boys, said Skipper, the leader of the crew. These were no ordinary penguins. These were commando penguins. Inside the base made out of concrete was a whole lair going deep underground. His team consists of Private, the Private, Kowalski, the scientist, and Rico, the weapons expert, who always wants to make destruction. 
Rico has the power to vomit any weapon out of his mouth. All across the zoo, animals amazed the people. Phil and Mason the chimps, Bing and Bat of the gorillas, Bailey, Brianna, and Brittany, the bunnies. Those bunnies were in one episode. I really overhyped their screen presence. As Skipper begins to admit defeat, he suddenly has an idea. The next day, Gus arrives and finishes the repairs without issue. I don't get it. I mean, what happened to their whole underground, you know, the, the ripping open of time and space? How could they have possibly? What, huh? Ooh. Come on, people! Let's move with a purpose! That's when we learned that the penguins created an entire replica of the Central Park Zoo. When Gus and the work crew arrived this morning, we simply diverted them into the decoy zoo. Where we let him finish the repairs on what he thought was the real penguin habitat. I feel like that must have been really challenging from an animation perspective, right? Just lining up all the UV maps on these flat surfaces. Like, I think, I, I think, I think that's how that works. Took one class in college. Why wasn't this my favorite episode? I have like fuzzy memories of vaguely enjoying this one. But I think this one's very clever and I like it now. Another 22 minute special, the All Nighter Before Christmas, marketed as Operation Decoration, which is clearly a superior title, sees the zoo prepare a mini Christmas ceremony for all the local kid animals of Central Park. Sunday, December 12th, in the Penguins' first ever holiday special. Time to jangle the jingles and kiss the kringle. They're on a very merry mission to save Santa. We are a go ho ho. Can they find him? Seriously, where am I? Before time runs out. Santa! Animals! Confused! Potato! Find out in Operation Decoration, the brand new Penguins' holiday special premieres Sunday, December 12th at 7, only on Nick. <laughs> Oh, minty! Julian switches all of the zoo inhabitants' preparation tasks, and now the lemurs are in charge of putting up a Christmas tree. Naturally, they steal the tree from Rockefeller Center. I'm a lumberjack! Ah, minty! Skipper is in charge of playing Santa, so he and Private head to the shopping district to study how Santa does it. That's when they discover countless mall Santas, and believe there's a huge conspiracy afoot. Then they break into this room full of off-duty mall Santas, and brutally interrogate them to figure out which one's the real Santa. This episode was a massive turning point for me no longer believing in Santa. Because I'd been told my entire life that the Santa we see in the mall is the Santa. I would have been in third grade when this episode came out, and this was my first exposure to alternate Santa lore. I watched this and I was like, have mom and dad been lying to me my whole childhood? Telling me that these mall Santas are the real Santa? And that's when the crack started forming. Now there's a huge chase scene as all the mall Santas try to stop the lemurs from stealing the tree. <laughs> they get home and everything's a disaster. Kids miss is ruined. And then the real Santa Claus shows up to the Central Park Zoo to talk to the animals. Hey, Julian. Sup, baby? Here we go way back. Oh, and also Santa recognizes Julian, and this is apparently an homage to Mary Madagascar, the made-for-TV holiday movie from the Prime timeline. This is basically the only time the show acknowledges the movies. Though in Mary Madagascar, it was established that the penguins have a bitter rivalry with Santa's reindeer, though that doesn't seem to have carried over in this episode. We meet again, South Polars, North Polars. Oh, okay, you guys know each other or something? It's a cold war that dates back centuries. You see, Santa used to be based in the South Pole. Kick him in the bells! Then it ends with everyone singing the worst song I've ever heard in my life. Merry Christmas! It ain't perfect, but it's Christmas! Yes! Somebody you days! Had a few minor glitches. In The Officer X Factor, the zoo animals are struggling with an intense heat wave. Captivity moment. <laughs> the penguins want to cool off in the East River. They send Alice on a vacation to get rid of her, but their plan is thwarted when X becomes a zookeeper to take her place. And they should have known that because they predicted this outcome in the very first episode. We must get rid of that insane zookeeper, Alice! Negatory! You'll just get more Alice's in her place. X makes the zoo completely inescapable, thwarting the penguins with horrible one-liners every time and in every place they go. But you birds are all catching the Officer Express. Allow me to blow your mind. Huh? 
X marks the spot. How did he get into their tunnels? I love him. X! 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 X again! They can count a harebrained scheme to take a pretzel cart airborne, and once they do, they become terrified by the possibility of X stowing away. And for over a minute, we just watch them be too horrified to open the hatch and look. And it's really unusual for a show this fast paced to take a whole minute on one joke when it's not Julian rambling. Because you know he's gonna show up somewhere, somehow, but you just don't know how it's gonna happen. And this is like the only time in the show where we see Skipper genuinely scared. <laughs> yeah, I can't do it. I mean, what if he's really in there? What if he leaps out with one of those witty one-liners? Probably something about pretzels. Something like, uh, I'll bet you never expected this twist. Exactly. And finally, there's nothing there. Nothing but pretzel salt. Evening, boys. This is where I rub some salt into the wound. Pretzel salt is released into the sky, causing a torrential downpour that cures the heat wave. The penguins battle X on top of the cart, and ultimately knock him down onto a taxi that takes him away as Alice returns. I love that the taxi is dropping her off at the zoo as if that's where she lives. The end. Banger. In Time Out, Kowalski invents a stopwatch that fully freezes time for anyone touching it. When Julian wants to figure out how long his new chewing gum maintains its flavor, he takes the watch and freezes time to finish chewing. When he starts time again, Kowalski tussles with him for control of the stopwatch, and they accidentally break it. Kowalski is unable to fix it, leaving Julian trapped in Kowalski. <laughs> Kowalski is unable to fix it, leaving him and Julian trapped in a single moment of time forever. They eventually decide to make the best of it and they become besties forever, taking over New York with a big Broadway-style musical number. And I got to admit, not bad. Not, not, not the worst. I'll flip you on your crown. I don't like how that sounds. Come on! This is not the fate I would have chosen. But you gotta love it. Time is frozen. Julian winds up having at least a solo episode with each individual penguin across the show. And Kowalski slash Julian always hit me as the most iconic as a kid for whatever reason. Look how much fun they're having today. Kowalski decides to invent everything he's ever wanted. And yes, this interdimensional toothbrush is the rip in the space-time continuum. I noticed that as a kid, but I didn't understand it was asset reuse back then. Must you stick your used gum everywhere? I don't... <laughs> I never sticked my gum anywhere. Well, uh, okay. I may have sticked my gum to a few things. You know, like uh, lampposts, benches, city buses, big statue lady, big zoo lady, the stopwatch, your pillow. Uh, a little bit. Okay, see, that's just what I- The stopwatch! What? When? What? Well, right after you broke it! Kowalski rushes to take the gum out of the watch, and the flow of time finally returns to normal. Everyone is very confused. This episode is one of the few that has its full animatic available online by storyboard artist Sue Neil Hall. And I love 3D storyboards because they don't have to be on model at all because all the animators are working with the same rigs. And they all look so goofy. It's so cute looking. You can also hear the voice actor's raw audio without all the sound effects layered on. Hey, these guys are good at the freeze tag. Really? I mean it. I am a statue. And now we've hit another special, Operation Antarctica. I feel like by this point, the writers noticed that Nickelodeon was rebranding all of their specials as Operation Blank, so they just started actually naming them that. In a brand new special, the penguins are headed to the one place they should never go. We're going to, dramatic pause, Antarctica. <laughs> They're on a mission to save their new friend. She's in trouble, Skipper. But who's gonna save them? Oh, no, Daddy! You might me spill more lemonade. Big Time Rush's Sierra Bravo guest stars in... Shut up and hop in. Operation Antarctica. Monday at 12.30. Part of an afternoon of premieres. The penguins battle and defeat poachers at a harbor. When Private falls into a fish processor, he meets a baby leopard seal named Hunter who's terrified out of her mind and wants to return to Antarctica. 
Some jerk snagged me in one of their stupid fishing nets. <gasps> You're all the way from Antarctica then? Are we really having a conversation right now? Private wants to help her return to the wild, but his team refuses to participate due to leopard seals being natural predators to penguins. Bird meat is gross. Has anybody here actually tasted penguin? Despite her insistence she's a fishitarian, the penguins will not help her. They just say, go south, and catapult her into the East River. Private doesn't want her to fend for herself and jumps under the catapult with her. To rescue Private, the gang boards their submarine and sets sails to Antarctica. I always thought they should have acknowledged that they had already gone to Antarctica in the movie, considering referencing the mean timelines on the table, apparently. But there's no acknowledgement that this is not their first time in Antarctica. Julian's also stowed away on their submarine, because we cannot have an episode without him. He pronounces vampire differently than how he used to pronounce it. Handsome vampire. I'm a vampire! Danny Jacobs recorded many episodes across many years, so I don't blame him for accidentally forgetting that little acting choice. The penguin sub is attacked by leopard seals and crashes at the bottom of the ocean. The good news is, the seals have left us for dead. I should mention this is also the bad news. Private and Hunter reach her family in Antarctica, and she's able to convince her dad not to eat Private. Then they invite him to dinner, where the meal is the rest of the team. Julian's uncomfortably excited to eat penguin. May I ask you what sort of penguin recipe you're using? Eat. The team is finally able to escape, though they're pursued by seals. <laughs> But when Private sees Hunter's father about to fall to his death, he risks his own escape to save his life. Hunter's father comes to respect penguins, and Private trusts Hunter to fling him with her mouth to the rest of the team where they triumphantly escape Antarctica. So here's something that, if Madagascar had one consistent continuity, would have been unintentionally great. The penguins are terrified of leopard seals and tell Private to stay away from them at all costs. In the opening scene of the 2014 movie, they rescue Private's egg from leopard seals right before he hatches. So that could serve as a great retroactive, deeper explanation of why they're so worried for Private here. But unfortunately, the movie canonically cannot coexist with the show because there we see Private join their unit immediately after hatching, whereas the show consistently establishes Private joined only relatively recently. We see glimpses of his past before he joined the team, and glimpses of the other's operations before his initiation. And the basic functional reason for this was so that Private could act as an audience surrogate and ask like, what's that, Skipper? What, what, what do you mean by this? And now we'll wrap up our season two exploration by going back a little bit in the timeline to the show's biggest event, the four-part special, The Return of the Revenge of Dr. Blowhole. Marketed as Blowhole Strikes Back. His methods are diabolical. His evil knows no bounds. And Friday, September 9th, Blowhole is back. Hang you with. Blowhole? Was that an entrance or what? In a brand new one-hour Penguins movie event. Everyone loves a penguin, right? Their biggest enemy ever wants some penguin payback. Fire the arch enemy seeking missile. Excuse me. What? Do you have the Wi-Fi in this place? I'm scheming here. There's a surprisingly lovely voice for villainous scum. But this time, they'll get some help from an old friend. It's showtime! Don't miss guest star. Say my name. Come on. Say it. Say it. Alex the Lion. This is where you applaud. In Blowhole Strikes Back. <laughs> Ow! Catch the world premiere Friday, September 9th at 8. Only on Nick. We open with Skipper on a solo mission in Shanghai, China. And yes, this is just New York Chinatown from Golden Squirrel. Caught that as a kid. That's when he's ambushed by Hans the Puffin. A big battle ensues, and Hans reveals his new boss. He is working for Dr. Blowhole. Blowhole steals Skipper's memories using the Mind Jacker and sends the comatose penguin into the ocean. Skipper washes up on an island, where his subconscious creates a spirit guide in the form of Alex the Lion, the only member of the Madagascar main four to make an appearance in this show. We get a vague acknowledgement of the movies. We used to be neighbors! Then a lot of crazy stuff happened and, well, spirit guide! The plot of the Madagascar movies can be entirely summarized as a lot of crazy stuff happened. And something I only found out, like a few days ago, Alex was not voiced by Ben Stiller here. He's voiced by Wally Wingert. And the reason I'm so shocked is because he sounds identical. As a kid, I had no concept of Madagascar's main cast members being celebrity stunt casts or anything. It didn't dawn on me as a possibility that they'd be too famous to show up for the Nickelodeon cartoon show. So I just assumed it was the same actor and ran with that belief my whole life. Alex guides an amnesic skipper's return to New York City. You're a spirit guide. Should you be driving? 
to stop Blowhole's evil plan. That being to access Skipper's memories, invade the Penguin's base using this intel, and use his new Diabolizer to turn Rico, Private, and Kowalski into mutant monsters. This special is great because it's actually paced like a, a normal piece of media, that is to say the scenes last longer than 40 seconds. My migraine went away while watching this episode, and that was wonderful, it made me really enjoy it. Throughout the episode, Kowalski's been building an experimental power cell, and Julian's been looking for a replacement battery for his MP3 player. He breaks into their base to steal Kowalski's power cell at the same time Blowhole arrives. The Diabolizer. Splast hits the MP3 player and power cell, fusing them together into a musical monstrosity which causes everything in its radius to burst into song. Only the best singer in its radius will be able to tame it. So now the last 16 minutes of the episode is almost entirely musical. It's like roughly the equivalent of if the show had done a singular 11 minute musical episode. And honestly, that's a really clever way to do it. The songs are... they're better than usual, honestly. I mean, when all the zoo animals are singing in their weird cartoon voices, it's not exactly something I'd listen to. Now that you point it out, we are crooning no doubt, and they can't help but sing along the Why the heck is that? I'd say Jeff Bennett and naturally Neil Patrick Harris are the only ones who have pleasant singing voices while doing their characters, so I don't think it's a coincidence that the vast majority of the lyrics were given to them. Take my experimental power cell and the Diabolizer's evil spell. I do have to confess that there are moments during these songs, little flashes that go unfathomably hard. It's up to me to step in and tame this super weapon. Then the penguins next the zoo, and finally New York City too! I might as well mention earlier this season, Jeff Bennett had a song that was like rock solid, genuinely like S tier Phineas and Ferb level. Guns midnight to dawn, no driver in sight, fueled by evil incarnate, never slowing down as it prowls the town, bowing animals down to their fate. <laughs> Blowhole tames the MP3 player and embarks to enslave New York City. Skipper and imaginary Alex arrive, reunite with the team, and go into the city to stop him. Someone who I respectfully don't believe is a singer is Tom McGrath. I remember everything this bird can sing. No, this, this bird cannot sing. I don't think so. Skipper and Julian create a distraction so the rest of the team can extract the power cell. Everybody get up and jump in the beat, go. Skipper uses the Mind Jacker on Blowhole, who finds himself performing back in Coney Island under the name Flippy. In the end, Skipper realizes he chose Alex as a spirit guide because he respects him. Which, like, they barely even interact in those movies, but alright, whatever. I'm glad they had a moment. Alex fades away, and the return of the revenge of Dr. Blowhole comes to a close. Honestly, I think it's great. I think it holds up as this wonderful big event right in the middle of the show. And it injected a lot of energy back into the proceedings because I'd honestly been checking out by this point. I committed to editing this whole video with a five day turnaround and I thought it'd be really cool to just let my facial hair grow out. Now it's day four. I just feel like it just like, I just, it just looks lazy. I feel like the only way to pull it off is by wearing a beanie because like, I guess it's like the incel look, but it's a fashionably valid look. If you don't have the beanie on, just any other headwear, it just looks bad. So because my job is to overanalyze, I'd like to inform you all that the layout of the Central Park Zoo is remarkably inconsistent. And I guess I'll be a transparent and say I'm pulling a lot of this from the wiki. I probably only noticed like half of these details on my own. It's a remarkably well-kept wikia. Like not even Zack and Cody or Wizards of Waverly Place have documentation this thorough of everything. The kids from like 2013, they did a good job. So first off, the map of the zoo that they always show never matches the aerial overviews we see. The only thing they really agree on is the idea that the lemurs, chimps, and Marlene immediately surround the penguins, which is comically the hub of the entire zoo. Whereas the movie is a generally accurate approximation of a zoo's layout, the show depicts a radial ring of most important characters to least important characters. In the actual wide shots of the show, Roy occupies the fourth spot next to the penguins, despite maps marking it as the flamingos, with Roy situated somewhere over here. The show can never decide if Pinky the Flamingo is the only flamingo or just one flamingo of many. It alternates. 
points. In the series, you can count on seeing Bing and Bada the Gorillas over here, and Bert the Elephant over here. However, the map doesn't include the gorillas at all, includes Bert in Bada and Bing's place, and puts Ted the Polar Bear in Bert's place which is where he was located in the actual movie. Despite him speaking and playing a major role in the Christmas Caper DVD extra, he never speaks in the actual show, to the point that it becomes a joke in and of itself. When was the last time you heard Ted the Polar Bear even say anything? Wow, that is so true! It's always the quiet ones. I don't wanna hear it! Also, this habitat. Good lord, this poor creature should not be here. I'm assuming. I guess I don't know that for a fact, but it doesn't seem correct. Another silent creature is the zoo's ostrich, Shelly. Except for one season three episode where she is voiced by Melissa McCarthy. There she has an obsessive crush on Rico. So she'll probably never ever come back, but hey, if you're in the market for a rebound relationship, I know a certain somebody who can help you out. Hint. It's me. Yeah. Although fun fact, she wouldn't have really been famous yet when she recorded this episode, because her breakout role, Bridesmaids, dropped in April 2011. This episode dropped in May 2012, and sure, it usually takes like a year for an episode of a cartoon to be made, but look at the production codes. This one was produced alongside episodes that had aired over a year ago in 2011. It just got delayed for whatever reason, which wasn't uncommon. There's just a lot of random delayed episodes. So Melissa McCarthy was just some actress, I think, who booked a role in the Penguins of Madagascar to play an ostrich. And then by the time the episode actually came out, she was the Hollywood celebrity on the same level as the celebrity stunt cast of the first Madagascar movie. So good for her. So back to the map. If we loop further out, we can see habitats for llamas, gazelles, and camels, none of which ever appear in the show. Though there are camels in a Christmas caper. Countless animals from the show are never depicted on the map, such as the skunks, badgers, baboons, big time rush beavers, or Leonard the koala. On that note, the baboons and badgers' habitats just reuse the animation model of the flamingo's habitat, while Leonard reuses Joey's. After Roger gets added to the zoo, an episode revolves around transferring Roger to the lemur's habitat and the lemurs into the petting zoo. A special map gets created for that episode, which adds those two exhibits to an unseen back corner, and adds Bata and Bing to the map, but in the place of Bert, for whatever reason. I don't think we see this expanded version again. Julian is the king of the zoo, simply because he decided when he arrived, and everyone just wholeheartedly resigned themselves to his reign. Did tell him to take care of King Julian's problem. Even the penguins who despise him respect his authority, except for Skipper. I wonder if King Julian will realize he can use the its power to summon a parachute. Nope. And now I'll make my young self proud by talking about the penguins' habitat in detail. First off, as a child, I could never understand if they dug out this area within their habitat, or if this room was already provided inside of here. Because if they dug this out of concrete with plastic spoons, then why is the brickwork so incredibly smooth? Or why would they be so comfortable entering and exiting when there's a zoo visitor looking directly at them? Or thirdly, if the existence of this room is a secret, then why would they be comfortable adding portholes? What's stopping someone from just getting in the water and looking in? That actually happens late in season three. Like when Gus drains the water around their enclosure, how did he not see the windows? I feel like now the answer is they dug it themselves and the explanation is don't think about it. But I was like genuinely unsure what the intention was supposed to be as a kid. On the subject of the lair, we know of 15 escape tunnels that we don't know where specifically they're accessed from. In the return of the revenge of Dr. Blowhole, an elevator shoots out of the ground and has multiple floors within. Hmm. Very nice. Work order establishes that a nuclear reactor is adjacent to this elevator shaft. The second exit point is behind this vault door, which was occasionally a shelf before the show settled on depicting it as an escape tunnel. And then something I caught, there's an episode in season three where hornets and rats are trying to get into the lair through the top porthole and the vault door. And Private's like, oh no, we're trapped. Dog, you have 15 escape tunnels, where are they? And let's say they're only accessible through the vault door. Use the elevator, go down, dog! But what's hilariously inconsistent is the question of what's behind this door, which Roger once refers to as their front door. Sometimes it's a hallway, sometimes it's a closet, sometimes it's Kowalski's lab. I personally choose to believe that there's a massive turntable back here, with multiple rooms on different points of the wheel, which spins around once per day to change what's accessible behind the door. I like to imagine that none of the penguins are able to control it rotating, so they have to rush to be back in their main room before the thing rotates, and if not, they'll be trapped back there for like five days until it cycles back to the entrance. Okay, now for the goofiest section of this video, we're gonna talk about ships. 
the ships of the penguins of Madagascar. Let's run through every single main cast ship to get our analysis of them. Are they a good match or should they both be assassinated? Let's find out. Rico and Miss Perky. This man would do anything for her. There's multiple episodes where he goes to hell and high water just to rescue her or buy her the new accessory she needs. And look at her face. She is smiling every second she's around him. Rico is clearly giving her everything she needs. Wonderful match, OTP. Kowalski's had his heart broken by Doris the Dolphin like 90 times and he cries every once in a while. Perfect match, OTP. Next, Skipper and Kitka. They existed. In one episode, Private falls in love with a human nurse and he tries to injure himself as much as possible to go see her. Poor young Private doesn't understand the concept of bestiality and why that's bad. Private has no knowledge of the fact that he cannot consent he's an animal. Also, she's clearly out of his league. She's a tall, beautiful woman and he's British. Private, mentally, is only in his 20s. He's too young to know about love. He's too young to hold hands with someone. We have to protect him. Mort and Maurice manage to pull no bitches to their crib this whole series. They're ROAs kings, in my opinion. At one point, Julian falls in love with a ferret. It's a long story. She's pretending to be a cat. She desperately tries to get rid of him and, you know, kill him. I think it's a good pair. King Julian also falls in love with Miss Perky a couple times and kidnaps her. Rico beats his skull in. King Julian also falls in love with Marlene for a singular episode. Marlene's involved in a lot of ships as a byproduct of being the only girl character, really. Julian's very possessive over her, gives her no real say in the relationship and tries to fight every other man who comes in his way. Bad ship. Cringe. Because I mildly dislike King Julian, I personally believe he deserves to die alone, sobbing near nightly about his lack of companionship. In this same episode, Kowalski builds a love you later. They use Marlene as the guinea pig because she's the closest species and try to find her one true soulmate in the park. However, it leads them to Fred the squirrel. Marlene buys into the device completely and falls head over heels in love with Fred, who himself is largely clueless to everything that's going on. I feel like we're, I don't know, I feel like we're clicking. Okay. Then she realizes Fred is a loser and dumps him. You know what, man? I think she was too hard on Fred here. Like, I, if I'm like 30, if I'm still single and I just see Fred across a bar, I, 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 I could honestly see myself just approaching him, offering him a drink. Like, I could see myself hitching my ride to Fred. Also clarify, he would have to be a human man in this scenario. Fred is the Riz God, the Riz Dizzler. Every man should be a little bit more like Fred in their pursuit of the romance. When I look in your eyes, you know what I see? What? Me. Oh, that is the sweetest thing anyone has ever- Um, could you hold still? I got some lettuce in my teeth. At the end of the episode though, we realized that the Love You Later led them to a sexy Spanish guitar playing otter in Central Park right next to Fred. Meaning that Marlene's one true soulmate is right here, a hundred feet beyond the zoo walls, and she'll never meet him. As a small child, I was overly invested in characters' romantic pairings. Just the thought of Phineas and Isabella was enough to make me blush. Eventually, in sixth grade, I learned the term shipping. It was, it was after school one day. This is my middle school. Let me give you guys a clear picture. At the time, it was light blue. It was colored light blue. Keep that in mind. But it was about roughly right here. In there were three kids vaguely in front of me, and the boy and the girl were flirting or something. And then this third guy, who was like the boy's friend slash wingman, I believe, was like, wow, I ship it. And then they, the two main ones sort of blushed. I don't remember if I knew these kids. I don't remember who they were, but I just remember this interaction. And I was like, wow, what's a ship? Uh, and then eventually I learned the truth. And that's the story of how I learned the word ship. At the end. And I was like, wow, what a weird trend term. I just, I never would have imagined that we'd still be using that word 10 years later. There's also like a Gravity Falls episode where they referenced memes. You're memeing fast. And I was like, wow, that's gonna be outdated someday. I thought memes were a temporary fad which would go away. Which in theory, they could still be. But more relevantly, I was, I was a, a, a passionate shipper and there's nothing more wild and entertaining than returning to these ships 10, 12 years later to see what they were actually like. It's been a wild experience because they're either the most toxic, awful pairing of all time, or the text is a manipulative, goofy dork about it. Like I reread the Percy Jackson books recently and every three chapters is a moment where Percy's like, wow, Annabeth looks almost pretty in this light? Hmm, weird, I wonder what that means. And it's like, Rick Riordan, you're cheating. Like, of course all the 12 year olds shipped Persabeth. What option did you give them? But Penguins of Madagascar is the first time I've returned to something in adulthood and the ship just straight up doesn't exist. 
As a child, I thought Skipper and Marlene were destined to become a couple. Over all these years, I thought of the fact that they didn't wind up getting together as a loose thread that the show never resolved. But neither of them have anything resembling feelings for each other. They're like, they, they're like co-workers. Like they co-inhabit the same space, they're fine with each other's existences. But that's it. Like some moments in my head crystallized as romantic moments, and in reality it's just them like, walking next to each other. What a beautiful day, huh? I'd say borderline glorious, Marlene. Yeah, it's days like these that I'll... What? What is that? Like, there's a ton of moments in the show where they save each other from various situations. But it's literally just because this is an action-adventure show and people save each other in every episode. Skipper and Marlene just happen to be the characters in this scene. <coughs> Are you my mommy? Or in Lost Treasure of the Golden Squirrel, Skipper yells, Marlene! But that's just what characters yell in shows like this when someone gets abducted. Marlene got taken by rats. Skipper's just the protagonist character they'd give this line to. Or at the end of Marlene's debut episode, Skipper says, Next time I find myself caught in the swirling currents of raw sewage, I hope that Marlene is at my side. And what I totally missed as a kid is that this is just the conclusion to Skipper's character arc in that episode, where he initially sees Marlene as just an unhelpful citizen, then by the end circles around to see she has value in a fight. We can't just leave a helpless victim in her time of need. Who's a helpless victim? <laughs> I found a skillin ship page on the Madagascar wiki skill issue and the examples of romantic interactions make me laugh so hard. They're just, he assured Marlene he could handle the mysterious visitors in the reptile house. Marlene says Skipper isn't fun day material so he begins bouncing to prove her wrong or possibly to impress her. Or my personal favorite, Skipper and Marlene high five in the opening. Oh they high fived? I guess they're in love. Like, sometimes you'll put his flipper around her shoulder, but he's just mansplaining shit. It's not romantic. She hates it. Hey! Not cool, dude. Marlene, I told you to leave this to us. No, you didn't. <laughs> In your mind, maybe. In general, he just, like, cuts her off every time she tries to talk to him. You'll never believe what I just saw over in the- EMERGENCY! <laughs> 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 What? How is Marlene an emergency? Private, I can smell a boring anecdote from 1.6 clicks away. Oh my gosh, I just heard the cutest story about baby kittens. <laughs> He'll just abandon her on missions entirely. Um, hello? Hey, guys, still trapped in here. And she is so over it all the time. Ah, she's a mem. Everyone knows they're all morons. But they aren't at each other's throats enough for it to be a compelling enemies to lovers. They're just like co-workers who have issues with each other's personalities, but are generally fine. You want me to judge what? A burping contest! The show as a whole does not care about romance. Every once in a while, there's a standalone episode where the plot revolves around love. Like the penguins might help Phil try to impress his crush by cooking up increasingly convoluted and bizarre plots for him to get her affection. There is one sure way to a female's heart. You start with a four-inch incision. There is an episode where Marlene is bleached by too much chlorine, and Skipper and Julian mistake her for an arctic mink named Arlene and compete for her affection as she tries to escape them. But it's just a vehicle for jokes. There's no character exploration. Skipper begins interrogating Arlene to figure out what she did with Marlene. There's no series-spanning romantic arc. The show does not care about love interests at all. Neither does the primary age demographic of eight-year-olds. So it is actually hilarious to me that I looked at all of these blatant non-signals as proof of romantic compatibility and inevitability. Penguins of Madagascar is the first show I watched as a kid where I discovered that Wikipedia had a list of episodes. I remember going down the list to try to find all the ones I hadn't seen yet. I'm pretty sure that's how I discovered It's About Time for the first time. I'm like 99% sure. I continued tracking that episode list for Penguins as well as every show I watched as a kid for the rest of my childhood. As a result, I remembered this series thoroughly, despite not thinking about it for like 10 years. Just looking at the list of season one episode titles, I'm almost embarrassed to say I knew exactly what every single one was. Like, oh, what goes around? That's the episode where Rico loses a doll and Officer X chases him through the alley. Oh, Mask of the Raccoon. 
That's the one where the Robin Hood guy steals everything from the zoo. Then we get to season two and it's a little bit spottier. I didn't know what a lot of the episode titles were, especially in the back half, but I could always figure it out within the first two minutes, sometimes from the very first joke of the episode. Like there's an episode that opens with everyone laughing at a joke in a classified file that Private's not allowed to look at. And immediately I was like, oh my God, the final line of the episode is, <laughs> Yeah, don't get it. As season two went on, there were quite a few episodes that I really just didn't remember the plot of until I heard specific trigger lines, which made it all come back to me. No, real Chinese food from the China. And then by season three, I could only remember a handful of the episodes by looking at their titles. My memory of these ones is generally a lot fuzzier because I wouldn't have seen them air as many times before I grew out of watching Nickelodeon. There are six specific episodes that for reasons I don't understand, I have no memory of at all in the third season. One of them being the Melissa McCarthy ostrich episode. And I remember every other episode, every single one, except for these six. There were seven episodes at the end that were never aired on Nickelodeon, withheld for years, and I had to track them down to watch them online. And yet I remember all of those ones well, despite only watching them once. I just don't remember these. And I had a DVR by this point. I had every episode set to record. I was monitoring the list of episodes on Wikipedia to look for new ones. So why doesn't any frame, any visual feel familiar to me? I would be willing to write it off, but it's three specific episode pairings that aired together and were produced together. That's what makes it odd. It's been kind of cool to look at the credits of the show and see people who are a lot more prominent in the industry now working in smaller positions. Like I saw a storyboard artist named Steve Loader and I was like, hold on, I know that name, who is that? He's a co-executive producer of Marvel's Moon Girl now. Wonderful show, I made a video about why you should watch it and if you don't watch the show or my video, you're a dork and you're ugly. Or you can see a lot of episodes were written by Bill Motts and Bob Roth, who are now the creators of Ghost and Molly McGee on the Disney Channel. Although they weren't exactly minor players in Penguins of Madagascar, they genuinely wrote one fifth of the episodes. So I watched the first five episodes of Molly McGee on Disney Plus when they dropped, and to me it just seemed really nostalgic. It felt like a show I would have watched growing up, and I feel like Bill and Bob must be that connection. And now I'll just quickly burn through a list of voice actors that I'm familiar with from other things. Barry the Frog talked. Do I need to break out the toxic touch? And it took me a minute. I was like, where's that voice? Where's that voice? Oh, Professor Bannister. I would then annex Canada to Greenland. Leonard the Koala, you may have already picked this up. Fancy hearing me scream, no! I had to look this one up. It's the voice of Scratch from Ghost and Molly McGee. Step back, please. No, that's too far. I did a little, no, come back. There, stop. There's a bunch of dodo birds in an episode. Boom! We're friends! And that's round trip from my chest pumper to yours. Dodo truth! See if you can guess it. Three, two, one. Brian Stepanek, aka Arwen. Well, if I wore them over my clothes, you'd think I was weird. He's an underrated voice actor, because he can do a lot with his voice, but he just doesn't voice act that often. And someone I picked up immediately, Brian Posehn playing a cockroach. Scatter, it's the Broly's. Most relevantly to culture and society, he played Nanosec in two episodes of Transformers Animated. I could do this all day, but I got a schedule to keep. <laughs> Okay, when I was a kid, I actually had a really solid idea for an episode of The Penguins of Madagascar. The penguins go on a train. That's it, that's all I came up with. But you know what? They model the subway car, have Hans the Puffin hijack the subway or something. Then we get like a classic train high story where they gotta move all the passengers to the back car. Boom, it writes itself. Or I, I, while watching it, I had another idea. What if there's like an actual James Bond style spy who's on a mission at the Central Park Zoo and the penguin's gonna have to like see what he's doing? Although that is kind of just the North Wind from the 2014 movie slash the Phineas and Ferb episode that did the same thing. So there's not that original. But one thing I think is original that I had an idea. What if the zoo added a fifth penguin to their habitat who was not a spy? So now the penguins have to hide their entire operation from him or her, let's get wacky. And Private wants to trust her. She's like, Skipper, she's just a nice little girl. And Skipper's like, no, she's a spy. And then the moment they all circle around to finally trusting her, boom. She is a spy. She captures them and takes their lair. Um, uh, and then you got a wicked recurring character. And then Marlene has to come save them or something. I don't know. That's all I had to say. A lot of shows clearly lose steam as they go on. So does Penguins? I feel like not quite. Do you know the rules? This no is Fred music, the Squirrel's actor. No I just noticed this by no accident. That's insane. The voice actors are as enthusiastic and energetic in episode 150 as they were in episode one. 
In fact, I'd say they're more energetic now. You never get the sense that they're tired of doing this after six years. Where I think the show starts to wane is in terms of inspiration, writing-wise. It's not necessarily that they ran out of ideas, is that their ideas no longer sustain themselves for 11 minutes. Let's look at a season one episode. Mort's kicked out of the kingdom for touching the king's feet, and goes to the penguins to help him cure his addiction. They put him through a training course and he seemingly overcomes his phobia, but when Julian's in danger, the only way to save him is by grabbing his feet. Mort overcomes his new programming to save King Julian. Everything in the episode follows one train of thought. Now let's look at something from late season 2. The penguins overhear a boy scout talking about his quest to perform daily good deeds and decide to do that themselves. They go to clean Marlene's habitat and accidentally make it worse. Rico throws a bucket which winds up injuring Mason's back. So they seek out Maurice's masseuse abilities, but Julian needs something before he'll lend Maurice. This sends the penguins down a chain of favors from all the zoo animals, each needing something before they'll help. They manage to fix Mason's back and celebrate with pizza, only to learn from a phone call that the driver will be fired if he doesn't deliver all his pizzas in time. Unfortunately, they just knocked him out. So to do a good deed, they take control of the vehicle and rush across town delivering pizzas, dropping the last one off in the nick of time. Then they waddle home, mission accomplished. That's a lot. There's like three different premises there. It's almost Simpsons-esque, where there's an inciting incident for the inciting incident for the inciting incident, but not like in a clever way. I don't know why The Simpsons is coming up so much today. In these later seasons, episodes have unrelated A plots and B plots, because the story seemingly can't fail 11 minutes on their own, and the end result is a really strange loss of focus. The show also becomes less and less grounded as it goes on. In season 1, there are limitations on what the penguins are capable of doing and inventing. As I mentioned, all their tech is made from plausibly accessible household objects. But by the end of season 1, we see the penguins build a submarine. We see private construct armor. And you start to think like, where did they get these materials from? But whatever. By the end of the series, Kowalski romps around in a metal mech suit, and you just have to accept it. I think the show's longevity necessitated wackier and wackier situations to spring up to avoid retreading ground. In season 1, we'll hear Skipper muse about the danger of space squids. Space squids, oh, we start with the heads. A bit later, we'll see the tentacle of a space squid grab a robot on distant Mars. But by the end of season two, space squids will invade the Central Park Zoo on a semi-regular basis. The Club Penguin space squids were like 100% inspired by this. There's no way they weren't. I think the best encapsulation of this evolution is that in very early season one, the penguins construct a space shuttle out of a trash can and launch it to the moon. At least they think they do. In reality, they crash landed onto an apartment roof next to the zoo, which they spend the entire episode thinking is actually the moon. But by season three, the penguins build functioning rocket shuttles and actually fly their trash can into distant space. And then they have to power it with burps, by the way, because that's the kind of show this is. More! <laughs> I'm coming! I've noticed that the penguins actually accomplish more meaningful things in this show. That is to say, in the movies, they use their advanced spy skills to simply do whatever dumb things they want to do that day. In their 2014 movie, they break into Fort Knox just to get some chips from the vending machine, and that's it. The grand plan they have to thwart is Dave turning all penguins ugly, not exactly world-ending. But in the show, they just straight up save the planet from global extinction on multiple occasions. Resurrect the dodo bird, discover mystical relics, save New York from mind control. And on the one hand, I feel like that takes away from their charm a little bit. But on the other hand, when you're making this many episodes, I absolutely understand the desire to raise the stakes and do more with the world. Also, when a show goes on for this long, it's inevitable for characters to get flanderized a little bit. Private starts as the gentle penguin, and in an early season two episode, he'll discover a preschool show called The Lunicorns. By the end of season three, he'll be mentioning The Lunicorns every few episodes at least. I will say though, as far as flanderization goes, it's not that bad or noticeable, and I think that's partly because these weren't exactly deep-layered characters to begin with. Although something that did start to rub me a little bit was the Penguin's aggressive take-no-prisoners attitude becoming a lot more pronounced by the end of the show. In late season 3, the Penguins want to send Private on NASA's space program in place of Phil, and their solution is to knock them out with a neuralizer. And it's like, I feel like if they had just explained this to the chimps, the chimps absolutely would have said yes, they've been your number one allies since the beginning of this series. The chimps seemed indifferent to this space mission in the first place, and I struggle to believe that knocking them out would have been their go-to solution in the first season. By the end of the show, they're a shade harsher in how they operate and how they treat their own allies. I feel like had the show gone on for another season, the penguins would have started to become kind of unbearable. Except for Kowalski, who already hit that point by the end of the show. By the last half of season 3, Kowalski undergoes the unfortunate transformation that many genius protagonists do 
and he talks down to everyone around him for no reason at all. Fall is the perfect time to observe the annual end of photosynthetic glucose production. Plus the leaves are so pretty! Yes, pretty leaves. We're watching the leaves change! Oh. Well, will it change into what, though? I, don't... I will not engage, I will not engage, I will not engage! And now, season three. The third season was produced as 15 22-minute episodes, resulting in 24 11-minute segments and three 22-minute specials. I think season three is where they're just kind of scraping for inspiration. Like, there's an entire episode where Skipper becomes deviant art, fan art. He just keeps growing and growing, and if he gets too big, he'll explode! And then it happens to Julian in the end, and Skipper writes him home. They just seem a little bit more gimmicky in nature, but that might also just be because I'm nostalgic for the first two seasons. And I remember these episodes, but I don't have the tingly feeling of joy while watching them. In Littlefoot, Kowalski uses his persona disentangleizer on Marlene so that she can watch a Spanish guitar performance in Central Park without her feral side emerging. Her violent impulses are removed, but unfortunately, they emerge as their own dangerous entity and begin attacking the entire city. X sees capturing Littlefoot as his opportunity to get rehired by animal control, and he's able to secure her. He's swiftly rehired. The penguins need to capture Littlefoot to restore Marlene to normal, so they break into animal control. These two halves of Marlene are flabbergasted, dog. Then they escape just in time. This must be one scary whatever it is. What the? <laughs> It would appear that this Officer X is indeed the Officer X who is obsessed with penguins. Not Officer X, just X. I hate penguins. Officer X is publicly disgraced once again, and Marlene's finally able to leave the zoo without going feral. She learns that she had the power inside of her all along. So maybe Lost Treasure the Golden Squirrel takes place after this one. Who knew? Or maybe she was just so busy thinking about the treasure hunt that she forgot to go feral. If it was psychological all along. It's day five, let's do this. Next up is an episode that I specifically remember disliking as a kid. The next 22 minute special, Operation Big Blue Marble. Tomorrow, it's a Penguin's Earth Day experiment. Science is on our side. Gone wrong. Oh, oh, that really undercut the moment. Will this be, uh oh, their last day on Earth? <laughs> we don't have parachutes. I had a budget. And somebody just had to have seat warmers. Sorry. Find out in Operation Big Blue Marble. The brand new Penguins Adventure premieres on Earth Day. Tomorrow morning at 11. Kowalski fuses fish and churros together into a euphoric new culinary experience. The furrow. The furrow machine, however, produces a toxic gas that's vented into the atmosphere. Eventually, the climate begins rapidly changing around Central Park. Penguins launch Private into space to investigate, where he discovers the toxic byproduct has morphed into a giant pulsing bubble in the atmosphere. Kowalski comes to the conclusion that they have to stop making furrows, as they risk making the Earth uninhabitable. Skipper, however, will not let furrows go and dismisses the claims of a changing climate. Central Park! Shh, Private! Let's enjoy these furrows without the lamestream media's jibber-jabber. Have you figured out yet this is a metaphor? Ah. The team defies Skipper and flies into space to destroy the bubble. Skipper eventually decides he can't leave his team behind, and the lemurs join him as he blasts their shuttle into space to save the others from their aborted mission. As the bubble is on the precipice of destruction, Julian hits a button and launches them inside of it. Out of fuel, the only way for them to escape and survive is for the lemurs to burp gas into the engines, and this montage lasts a full minute. Even as a fifth grader, I thought this was too much. It, it made me uncomfortable, and I did not like it. The group escapes by a hair. Julian burps in Skipper's face, the end. This is the only special without a special guest star, and I can guarantee you that if Neil deGrasse Tyson or someone were in this Earth Day episode, this scene would not have been there. So why didn't I like this as a kid? It's actually not the climate change. I don't remember if I even identified that allegory. I just thought it was underwhelming as a 22 minute event episode. It's not really exciting, and I still think that about it. This is the only 22 minute special that easily could have been cut down to 11 minutes without losing much. How about you skip the private launch to orbit set piece and just have them see the bubble on a news broadcast? Cut out four minutes. How about they blow up the bubble and then the episode ends instead of them getting sucked back inside for this prolonged montage after the climax? They successfully launch the missiles that will destroy the bubble at 17 minutes in. All you need to do is cut out six more. How about you get rid of the three separate scenes where the lemurs are like, wow, the climate's weird today. 
<laughs> There's just so many more 11 minute episodes that could have benefited from a double length expansion, you know? Seems like a waste of a slot, and it's the only special that doesn't feel special. And something I notice now is that it's kind of weird that this entire show does not touch any hot button issue. And then all of a sudden, there's this episode with his firm, hard stance on climate change. Like, the show loosely alludes to real things happening. Women in the military, Dr. Blowhole melting the ice caps, the general idea of captivity. But the show never takes any firm stance on those. Did you know a petting zoo is not a sheep's natural habitat? I had no idea. Misunderstanding was just a gag reel. Dr. Blowhole was causing the Arctic meltdown, not speeding it up. If it's part of a plot, you might see the animals want to get out of the zoo, but if not, they'll all be perfectly happy where they're at. Which makes this episode feel like a huge anomaly in that sense. And I guess I don't mind that it's here, but it's just odd. And next up, Private and the Winky Factory. Private discovers that the manufacturer of peanut butter Winkies is going out of business, and determines that he will stop at nothing to get his flippers on a box. Skipper, seeing his leadership potential, puts Private in charge of the mission to the factory. Once there, Private politely gives Rico permission to snag a box of marshmallow meow meows, and that puts the entire mission in jeopardy as Rico falls into an uncontrollable meow meow sugar high, thwarting the gang's operation at every turn. Kowalski ends up resembling a meow meow after falling into candy. Rico chases him, so now it's down to Skipper and Private. Nothing matters but the mission! Oh! Hey, hey, Private! Buddy! Yeah. What would Skipper do? Just get the mission done. Nothing matters but the mission. What? That doesn't sound like me at all! <laughs> Private ultimately feels so guilty about leaving Skipper behind that he abandons the Winkies and follows him into the tube, which leads outside of the factory for some reason. Despite the fact that this same tube sucked up a hundred Winkies, they're nowhere to be seen. Private learns not to put candy before his friends, and Skipper tells him the correct lesson to learn is that leadership is his job. <laughs> 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 things I have seen. I don't really have commentary on this one, I just remembered it really well. Like, for whatever reason, I remembered this was one of the last episodes, but I just have this thorough memory of every plot beat that I don't have for anything else in Season 3, and I'm not sure why. Skipper Makes Perfect is one of those six episodes I have no memory of, and I just know for a fact this is an episode I would have remembered had I seen it. When Skipper's having a seemingly perfect day, he decides to raid the Danish embassy to destroy his file and clear his name. We see flashbacks to his dramatic battle with Han that got him banned, and I cannot believe in the bottom of my heart of hearts that I ever would have forgotten this because I loved Hans the Puffin, I remember all of his other appearances, and I thought it was so funny that Skipper was banned from Denmark. But it also doesn't make any sense that I would miss an episode of the show. So I DK. A Danish agent recognizes Skipper and the Penguins as they evade security. So apparently Skipper was genuinely banned by the Danish government. I'm not sure how that doesn't blow his cover. That's never really rectified. Once again, I think it's funnier if Skipper just thinks he was banned in Denmark when that has no basis in reality. Kowalski monitors the operation from a window washer, while Rico and Private create the ideal distraction to occupy the Danish. As his teammates fall, Skipper abandons his post to save them, but conveniently finds the key to the safe and snatches the file. He burns it, and hurrah hurrah, Skipper is no longer banned from Denmark. The final episode to air on Nickelodeon was Good Night and Good Chuck. Throughout the whole show, Jeff Bennett has voiced this news reporter named Chuck Charles. This is Chuck Charles and I cannot swim. Help! Today his broadcast brings some bad news. I'm being told local legend Chuck Charles has been let go and replaced with rival anchor Pete Peters. I let go? Uh, doesn't that mean- God. Pete Peters here! At the lowest point of his life, Chuck takes up a job at the Central Park Zoo. His journalist instinct involuntarily kicks in, and he looks for any scoop or story he can find, eventually discovering the penguins and their operation. He steals a disc with footage of everything they've ever done, and brings it to the newsroom to reveal their secret and get his job back. Call me Nun Chuck Charles! <laughs> The Penguin's every effort to stop him fail, until... With this footage, my career will rise to even greater heights than before! Sweet! Oh. The entire world is shown video evidence of the Penguins of Madagascar, aka reused footage from other episodes. And as X gloats to the world, the world starts laughing. Those are the most fake penguin puppets I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's the most fake news story I've ever seen. 
which almost makes this entire series' effort to maintain their cover pointless because their cover was just blown and no one cared at all. Sources say his career is... <laughs> What a wackadoo story that was. Chuck's reinstated and dedicates his next broadcast to the Penguins. This next report is dedicated to a special feathered foursome. I've always remembered Good Night and Good Chuck as the episode where he learns their secret, and I probably only watched this once because it was the final episode to air. Over all these years, I've thought of it the same way that I think of Stacy learning Perry's identity, which is to say missed potential. I always thought it was a shame that they didn't do more with this, but what I didn't understand at the time was that this was the final episode they made, so there were no opportunities to have Chuck Charles go on a mission with the Penguins or something. In two years after Good Night and Good Chuck came the 2014 film Penguins of Madagascar. No the at the beginning. You know the Penguins of Madagascar, but what you don't know is they've been leading a double life as secret agents. When the world needs saving. After them! All right, boys, it's just like Cuba, Venice, Rio de Janeiro. Heroes. We don't need these guys. Become legends. Penguins are our flesh and feathers. If anyone's gonna save us, it's us. DreamWorks Penguins of Madagascar. Picking up mere seconds after Madagascar 3 in the prime timeline, absolutely nothing from the series is acknowledged as the original actors reprise their roles. There's no Marlene, no mention of Blowhole or Manfredi or Johnson. And given that the frequent series writer Brandon Sawyer co-wrote the screenplay, I would assume this was a conscious effort. And I almost feel like, wouldn't that be more confusing for kids? Because logically, wouldn't the kids who want to go see a Penguins of Madagascar movie also be interested in watching the Penguins of Madagascar show? It seems like there's some overlapping in the demographics there. I've always wanted to see what Marlene would have looked like rendered with the extra detail and fur of the movies. The characterizations Shuli and McCorkle developed are stripped away. Skipper is no longer paranoid, Kowalski's no longer a mad scientist. He's depicted as a huge pessimist in this movie, whereas I'd argue his show counterpart was more of an optimist, at least until the end. Rico still speaks in gibberish, but that was established in a Christmas caper. <laughs> Here, his voice is provided by Shrek 2 director Conrad Vernon, to re-establish the DreamWorks director's voicing the penguins angle. Conrad had been the voice of Mason the Chimp since the beginning of the franchise, and had presumably watched John DiMaggio perform as Rico countless times. He may not have though, I'm not sure if their voice actors were in the same room or not. In the movie, otters get mentioned and the name Doris is said. Get out of there! Move! You have a great otter there. Moo. Listen up, Doris! You turn us into freaks! And then what? I feel like those could plausibly be references to Marlene and Doris the Dolphin, but they could plausibly just be coincidences as well, because keep in mind, the story credited for other writers who did not work on the show. There's a couple similar ideas, Kowalski being down bad for a girl and Skipper forgetting names. Dave, Dave, Dave. You know, Peaches. Alex. Right, Alex. But as far as I can tell, the only concept introduced in the series that carried over was that of Skipper's Log. Skipper's Log. Skipper's Log. In the show, he had an actual tape recorder, whereas in the movie, he just says it to no one in particular. The Penguins are once again hilarious in this movie. I think they probably have a better comedic hit percentage than in the series. From the odd shape of this bagel, I'd say we're headed for Paris. France? Forget it! Not with their tax laws! I really appreciate how much more cinematic the action sequences are. Like this plane skydive scene, for instance, is more complex and engaging than any set piece in the entire series. By far, it's not even close. It's just this uninterrupted three minute shot. Like there's hidden cuts, obviously, but it flows so well. Why is Private suddenly handing out pretzels and why does Skipper think it's so important? I just, <laughs> they're so funny, I just love them. I always found it distracting that they puncture holes in the plane and open a door and yet nothing gets sucked out. Like, looking at it now, it's even weirder because in Madagascar 2, that did happen. Like, showing people getting sucked out of a plane may have been too graphic, so their solution was to have basic physics not affect anyone on this vehicle. And I think that's for the best, because on a basic moral level, the penguins of Madagascar should not kill hundreds of innocent civilians. That's where we would have gotten by season 4. It's also great to give the characters actual sincere emotional moments. I can't lead you this time, but... <laughs> We're a team, and, and you're our skipper. Skipper, we don't, we don't need these guys. No Kowalski, but 
Private does. And I know this is the most surface level stuff, but the series had nothing like this at all ever. The movie acts as an origin story where we see the group leave Antarctica before eventually winding up in the Central Park Zoo. But does that not completely contradict Madagascar? Do you ever see any penguins running free around New York City? Of course not. This is all some kind of whacked out conspiracy. We're going to the wide open spaces of Antarctica. You can actually go there? Uh, that clip of Marty speaking can serve as an excellent segue to addressing some comments on the Zack and Cody video, which pointed out that I referred to Chris Brown as Chris Rock several times, and I, I admit I may have made a blunder there. I do recognize that these are different individuals and that Chris Rock did not domestically abuse Rihanna. I do see now the common factor that may have led to me subconsciously confusing them. They're both named Chris, and you know, also, they're both men. I would like to issue a formal apology to the black community by saying, this is Chris Evans, this is Chris Pratt, this is Chris Pine, and this is Chris Hemsworth. The 2014 movie also gave way to literal military propaganda, where DreamWorks teamed up with the United States government to make a video where the silly penguins from TV praised the accomplishments of the military industrial complex to millions of children. Skipper, what is got your six? Military slang. Moon boy, I've got your six. 12 being forward, six is behind you. Then got your six means taking care of each other. Veterans Day is the day we celebrate the men and women who have served our country in the military. The people who are in service to something bigger than themselves. Bingo! And I think the government wrote this script because the penguins do not talk or act like they ever have before. Thank you, but I have to ask. Do you mind if we shoot a few hoops? Go right ahead. Skipper says Kowalski Recon at one point. Kowalski Recon, sir. That is not his catchphrase. I hereby order that all of us spread the news about Operation Got Your Six. Do you think President Obama wrote this himself? The 2014 movie's tie-in media also has a lot of bizarre rabbit holes that I'd like to fall down. I noticed the official YouTube videos kept using character models from the show as the end card of clips about the movie when these are clearly two different designs. Jordan, your video about the show is using the movie designs in its thumbnail. No, Jordan. I also noticed some YouTube videos credit Brian Stepanek as the voice of Skipper. That's Arwen. And I don't know why. Who are you? What do you want? Where'd you come from? It's actually becoming like brainstorm slash green needle for me. Where when I hear the clips right next to audio of Tom McGrath, it sounds like Tom McGrath, but when I listen to the clips right after an audio of Brian Stepanek, it sounds like Brian Stepanek. And that is why you never bobsled on a cheese grater. The student becomes a- wait, what am I saying? You're still the student. Anyone ever tell you you have a really flat head? Skipper here, to teach you how a spy can always expect the unexpected. Like, is it actually possible that Brian Stepanek was a ghost voice actor for Skipper, who just silently filled in for Tom McGrath sometimes? Throughout the whole Zack and Cody video, I was like, man, he's on Cameo, I should reach out to him. But then I was just like, ah, it doesn't need to. But I was finally like, all right, Penguin of Madagascar, it's time to reach out to Brian Stepanek. And he's gone! He was just there last month! Cameo does have a message feature. You can DM Brian Stepanek for $6, and like, in this economy, for that price, you can't afford not to message Brian Stepanek. So I did make an attempt, but I haven't heard back, which I wasn't expecting to, given that most people probably aren't monitoring their Cameo DMs, especially when they're not actively on Cameo. So it remains a mystery. And another thing, I love more than anything when studios try to artificially create memes, and they wholly fail. And one of the most spectacular face plants I'm acquainted with at the moment is called the Penguin Shake. So this guy comes out. Hey, what's going on, y'all? It's Twitch here. And he comes out and he teaches everyone the steps to do the hit dance, the Penguin Shake. No relation to the Grimace Shake. And then after showing an epic elite dance music video, we are told, Tag your Instagram video with hashtag Penguin Shake to be part of the world's longest music video. DreamWorks Penguins of Madagascar in theaters November 26, ready PG. So DreamWorks was very clearly trying to create their own version of Pharrell Williams' Happy, but with the Penguin Shake. And when you actually go to explore this hashtag, no one did it. It took me six minutes to scroll the entire hashtag at like a moderate speed. And if you disclude all of the paid promotions of the Penguin Shake, there's about 10 from dance studios and 10 from little kids. 
And sure, you may argue that it's almost 10 years old. A lot of those accounts may no longer exist. A lot of them may have been privatized. But if you, let's say you look up Harlem Shake from over 10 years ago, there are many, many, many examples still. No one cared about the Penguin Shake. No one did it. And DreamWorks, as far as I can tell, never released the music video at all because there weren't enough. And it's so funny to me. Uh, but anyways, uh, uh, I, 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 what the fuck am I saying? I like this movie. Uh, as a kid, I was bummed it didn't connect to the show at all, but I'm, I don't know, I'm all right with it now. I'm not sure if this is a controversial opinion or not, but I strongly prefer Penguins of Madagascar over the Madagascar movies. Let me check Shea DreamWorks ranking video to investigate. He is the common man. I feel like he has the median opinions of society. Ooh, brought to you by Squarespace. One platform to build a beautiful online presence. 21st place? Like, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, at least it's above the other ones. He put this below B movie? Three months after the movie, in February of 2015, the show slowly began dripping out its final episodes. In Operation Swap Pan Z, the penguins sabotage NASA's plans to send Phil into space by incapacitating the chimps and sending Private in their place, only to come to his rescue upon the realization that NASA won't be sending him back home. Snowmageddon sees Kowalski develop cabin fever while he and Private are trapped in Fred's tree during a freak storm, while Skipper and Marlene have to hold their own against minimum wage convenience store employee X. Throughout the show, the nasty rich Vesuvius twins have terrorized the animals of the zoo. In Night of the Vesuviuses, they buy out an overnight package. However, the zoo animals have had enough. We're not trapped in here with those twins. They're trapped in here with us. The penguins reluctantly protect the Vesuviuses from violent mob mentality, with their protective custody accidentally proving far more painful and traumatizing than anything the other animals would have done. In the end, they learn a valuable lesson. From now on, we'll only be mean to people. People who have less money than we do. No! Or in Best Foes, Skipper is zapped by Kowalski's malfunctioning enemy detector and sees his friends as rivals. He teams up with Hans to terrorize the Central Park Zoo, and Skipper as an enemy proves to be terrifying. Julian becomes the key to defeating him, due to Skipper's surprising tolerance of him in this new state. I think that would not mean he is not thinking I am a friend in the real life. Um, roughly. <laughs> And I adore the fact that Julian simply hasn't noticed that Skipper hates his guts across the last seven years. Two big guest star episodes were delayed to this forgotten batch. The special Operation Lunicorn Apocalypse features Conan O'Brien as an ancient apocalyptic spirit named Kuji Kukan, who accidentally takes Private's Lunicorn doll as his host body. Once I possess this loaf of smoked cheese, two weeks later, BAM! Six worlds destroyed. See ya! Compared to that, this body is- Hugs are the best medicine! <laughs> Okay, that wasn't me. A heroic spirit possesses Mort, and the gang races against time to prevent Conan from annihilating the planet. So Andy Richter is a frequent collaborator of O'Brien, to the point that when you Google Andy Richter, Conan's in almost all of the pictures. So I think on a meta level, the idea was to have Conan O'Brien battle Andy Richter. And I like to imagine that Andy Richter had to like convince Conan to do this. Like the executives were like, put in a good word for us, Andy Richter. Tunnel of Love, meanwhile, sees the penguins recruit the big time rush beavers to help them repair their escape tunnels before they collapse and bring down the whole zoo. In a rush, big time! Jeanette McCurdy and Victoria Justice complicate matters with their obsessive crushes on the beavers, turning the entire situation into an intricate web of interpersonal relationships that Skipper struggles to navigate. If Becky will go out with me. Listen, Kendall likes you. Let's go tell him how much more you like him when he's working, okay? Like I would go for Kendall. I like Logan. Oh, of course, who doesn't? Okay, Logan, have at it. Hello, Becky. That's Logan? Oh, I meant Carlos. Carlos, Becky is, quote, totally into you. That's cool, but I'm more into Stacy. Stacy, go talk to Carlos. He likes you. Carlos? Um, what about Kendall? Kendall, OMG! And it's crazy to me that this was delayed because Big Time Rush were like Nickelodeon as biggest stars at the time. And by the time it finally aired in 2015, their show had been over for years and they weren't even popular anymore. For years, Wikipedia showed me that there was an upcoming slash unreleased episode called Tunnel of Love. And I speculated the whole time that the episode would be about Skipper and Marlene going into a log ride Tunnel of Love thing that the Beavers made. And then I finally watched it and that didn't happen and I was like, oh, okay. But I believed that so hard over those many years 
that superseded my memory of what actually happened. So going into this rewatch, I genuinely misremembered this episode as being about Skipper and Marlene going on some weird log ride. And I knew nothing romantic would have happened, but I just thought they were talking about like some other plot relevant thing while in the log. I created a memory of a scene that doesn't exist. So why did Nick stop the show? Like, my initial idea was maybe the studio didn't want the show to distract from the movie, but that doesn't make any sense because Madagascar 3 premiered seven months ago and the movie was two years away. It literally would have taken four weeks to air the final episodes, and they just didn't. John DiMaggio confirmed years later that the show had ended production, so how are the ratings? Big chunks of the show weren't reported, but if you look at what was, this doesn't look like an awful decline, especially after four years. And keep in mind, this was the beginning of the era where people stopped using cable and flocked to streaming. So when you take that into account, these numbers do not seem bad to me. It's kind of funny to think that I was most likely a statistic on the majority of episodes. My earliest conscious memory of watching an episode the day it came out was Skorka, because it was the beginning of a five-day sprint of episodes, new 11-minute segment every day. To this day, I don't think there's ever been an explanation for why Nickelodeon a. Stopped producing the show, but B. Withheld the final episodes from airing. It's just odd to me. It's now December of 2015. It's been over a year since the movie, over three years since Good Night and Good Chuck, and the Penguins of Madagascar finally squeaks out its final episode. Night of the Vesuviuses. But its second to last episode, in both production and broadcast order, is what I consider to be the spiritual finale to the Penguins of Madagascar, the culmination of many storylines. The Penguin Who Loved Me. On a standard day, Kowalski is startled by a new face. Parker the Platypus. We're getting dangerously close to a lawsuit with that one. As a kid, I loved platypuses so much as you can see from this Valentine's Day holder folder I made in third grade, I think, where we had to draw the three things we love the most, and I chose Lego Mars Mission, platypuses, and school. Honestly, I'd still choose the same three things today. Had this episode aired when it was supposed to, I would have been overjoyed by seeing a platypus in the Penguins of Madagascar, and I was robbed of that. Parker tells Kowalski that Doris the dolphin needs his help, and he swiftly leaps into action. We finally meet Doris. Kowalski is hopeful that she might finally want his love, which I'm sure he'd be great at providing to her. Though unfortunately, she reveals that Parker is her boyfriend. It'll never work, Doris. Is he bird? Is he mammal? If he can't commit to a species, how can he commit to you? Listen, I've heard this all before. Except then it was about Doug the porpoise or Harry the octopus or Pete the manatee. He was ugly on the inside, too. Listen, Kowalski, I like you. I do. I really like you. I like you. But I'm never gonna like you like you. Can you understand that? Kowalski throws a tantrum. This episode's kind of him at his worst. Or, you know, real Chase Davenport energy here. Doris's brother, Francis, is trapped in captivity at the Aqua Park Seaville, and she wants Kowalski's help to break him out. The group manages to sneak in, and Parker outshows Kowalski at every turn. Had this episode aired in 2012, Penguins of Madagascar would have beaten Phineas and Ferb to the punch of acknowledging that platypi are brown and have poisonous angle barbs. But alas, Primal Perry stole their thunder. We finally meet Doris's brother as well. Oh shit. This would have been a way better plot twist if they hadn't shown Blowhole in the opening credits. Why would they do that? Parker clarifies to our heroes that Francis, Flippy, and Blowhole are one and the same. And he's a bounty hunter tasked with returning Blowhole to his army. He incapacitates everyone, even his own girlfriend. I'm wondering if he was just dating her for this job. It's never clarified, but you know, love the commitment if so. He brings Blowhole back to an island lair and his lobster minions try to restore Flippy's memory so Blowhole can sign the check for Parker. Plunger. <laughs> Wrong button. McGuffey. <laughs> Library card. Confetti cannon. Chrome claw. Ooh, go back to the confetti cannon. Doris helps the penguins escape from Seaville, and on their way out, we finally see, after all this time, Manfredi and Johnson, who are still alive. Hey, Manfredi. Yeah, what's that, Johnson? Was that Skipper? And the, and the guys? Skipper! Guys! It's, it's us! us! Come back! Let's never go there again. The team arrives at Blowhole's lair and there's a huge battle. Boom, pow, or whatever. Doris accidentally recovers the Mind Jacker, which restores Blowhole's evil personality and memories.
He traps his sister and resumes an abandoned evil plan. Project Bad Tidings. Which will pull the moon closer to the Earth, disrupt the oceans, and cause worldwide flooding. Kowalski is able to save the day, and Rico destroys the Innator. As the lair collapses, Doris stops Parker from stealing the submarine and breaks up with him. Our heroes escape. Doris, like 10 minutes after breaking up with her boyfriend, says, Kowalski, I love you now, and kisses him. I've never seen you in action before. You were so brave and smart and confident. It was kinda hot. Yeah? And you know what? Kowalski's the only down bad protagonist I've covered so far who has not been creepy and overbearing. He didn't so much as contact Doris throughout this whole show. He respected her boundaries. He just sobbed on his own. So you know what? Let's, ju let's just give him this. Congratulations, Kowalski. Skipper determines that they have not seen the last of Blowhole, who floats across the ocean as Parker demands payment and stabs him with his spurs. I can't pay you. My checkbook got destroyed. What can I do? <laughs> okay, okay. I've got some gift cards you can have. You like the pasta barn? They've got bottomless salad and infinite breadsticks. And now we've seen the last of Blowhole as well as the series as a whole. To me, this just feels like a finale. We get special graphics at the beginning instead of the normal bomb rolling. This final scene feels like a riding off into the sunset moment. It's not the Penguin's final adventure, but it's our goodbye to them. To me, it's satisfying in that regard. Kowalski won the love of Doris, we finally met Manfredi and Johnson, and we've defeated Blowhole one last time. I can't believe I'm saying this, but I wish the lemurs were here. This is the one special that they don't completely override. They just have like one 20 second scene near the beginning. I wish Marlene was here too, you know? Let's have Skipper and her kiss right here next to Doris and Kowalski, why the hell not? But as a whole, when it comes to the Penguins of Madagascar, their role in pop culture, I'm satisfied. I don't think we need a continuation of this show. I don't think we need more Madagascar movies. This franchise has run its course and we've spent countless hours with these characters and that can be enough. But that being said, <laughs> something I thought about. Shrek had this mid-ass spin-off film in 2011, Puss in Boots, directed by Chris Miller, the voice of Kowalski, funny enough. And then 11 years later, for no discernible reason, they decided to make a sequel that was the most beautiful, poignant animated masterpiece anyone's ever made in the world. And just imagine how funny it'd be if they made a Penguins of Madagascar sequel that was, like, actually good. <laughs> like, with deep themes, like, Skipper grapples with his own <laughs> mortality. So I think the only way I'd be okay with Penguins of Madagascar returning is with an Oscar-nominated pop culture phenomenon called The Revival of the Return of the Revenge of Dr. Blowhole. I feel like there's an argument to be made that this series was too much of a good thing. Just about every line Skipper has in the Madagascar movies is laugh out loud funny. I never thought I'd say this on American soil, but the Ruski's right. But there aren't as many lines. In the series, the majority of lines probably go to Skipper, and most of them are basic plot functionality lines. The Penguins are the main characters here. They have to deliver most of the exposition just for these stories to practically flow. The Penguins are no longer walking non-sequitur machines. They have narrative responsibilities, and thus a smaller percentage of their dialogue is designed to make you laugh. There might also be an element of diminishing returns. When Skipper knocks out the boat captain in Madagascar, it's funny because of how out of nowhere it is. When we see him knock out New Yorkers multiple times per season, each instance will garner less and less of a reaction. But on the other hand, this is just who these characters are. It would feel wrong if they weren't knocking people out. And this is just an inevitable challenge that comes up when you're expanding the role of comic relief characters. To plop this series in my final ranking, it's probably C tier above Lab Rats. That feels about right. Like I enjoy it a lot, but there's nothing that hugely memorable and nothing emotionally resonant. To circle back to my initial question, why did the Penguins of Madagascar fall into cultural obscurity? There isn't as much to come back and enjoy as an adult, as you might expect, and the series may have diminished the character's overall comedic hit percentage that we came to see in the movies, but I still can't help but feel like it deserves to be better remembered. I strongly prefer the Penguins from the show over the Penguins in the movie. John DiMaggio will always be Rico to me, and I think Jeff Bennett will always be my Kowalski. As much as I lambasted it, I do believe this series to be a highlight of the Madagascar franchise. I'll always remember it fondly, although I may have been a little bit happier leaving it as a memory. Okay, I'm gonna go accidentally cut myself while shaving. 
Uh, bye, everyone. Remember to subscribe. Tell me who's your favorite penguin and why is it Skipper or Kowalski? Because let's be real, it's not one of the other ones. Who is your favorite penguin? My chaotic side is telling me Rico, but my wholesome side is telling me private. I, I can't choose.